Yeah, typically I, I uh, reboot my computer before these things. So. Okay, here it is. All right. Okay, so Jack, you are. Yeah, good to... I'm good to go. You are good to go. And I forgot to mention to you, um, we should have that timer capability. Oh, back? Tonight. Oh, okay. Back. I, I'm, I think. I think I can manage it for you. Awesome. Okay. Alrighty. So welcome to the planner. Uh, welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of August 4th, 2021. My name is Jack Chemsek, and as the chair of the planning board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.36 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and it's available via Amherst Media live stream. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this planning board uh, meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may, be, may do so by following the link shown on this slide. This link is also available on the meeting agenda po posted on the uh, town's website calendar listing for this meeting or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the meeting will be permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access uh, the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event, we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship. And despite best efforts, we will post on the Town of Amherst website an audio or video recording transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then uh, place yourselves back on mute. And I believe, yeah, I'm just looking at our roster here. Yeah, okay, so uh, Maria Chow will not be here. Um, Andrew McDougall will not be here. Uh, so Tom Long Present. and uh, Doug Marshall. Present. Janet McGowan. Present. Johanna Newman. Present. And, you know, myself. So that's five of the seven. We have a quorum. Um, so board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. Discussion may be suspended. Uh, while the issues are addressed and the minutes uh, will note if this happens. Please use the raise hand function uh, to ask question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Opportunity uh, for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period and is reserved for comments regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Public comment may also be heard at other appropriate times during the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Please indicate uh, you wish to make a comment um, by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. So uh, residents can express their views up to three minutes and at the discretion of the board chair, if a speaker does not comply with the guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. So um, Pam, we don't have minutes, is that correct? You are correct. Okay, hey, we have Chris here too, which is good, good. Mm -hmm. And then so uh, public comment, I'm looking uh, within our, um, you know, attendees and if there are any hands raised we will definitely, uh, you know, uh, hear your comments. And I see none. Okay, so let's get into this. And we have uh, number one on our agenda at six thirty four, six forty, and this is you know six thirty five. So we're 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 good to proceed with this. This is SPR 
2022-01 of Amherst, Sweet Alice Trail, Bay Road. Request site plan review approval under section uh, sections 3.335, 7.9, and section 8.5 of the zoning bylaw to construct a new uh, 20 space parking area, including one accessible space and adjacent loading zone and to install appropriate signage for access to the Sweet Alice Trail Recreation Area, which is map 25B, parcel 55, and it's an RO zoning district. So, um, Rob, are you gonna make a presentation on this? Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, I am, uh, and Pam's gonna help me out by bringing up the uh, couple of plans if she can go ahead and do that. Uh, so I, I'm Rob Moore, Building Commissioner. I work in the Conservation and Development Department and assisting Dave Zomek, uh, the Director of Conservation and Development with improvements to a number of uh, trail parking locations across town. Uh, so this is the first application for that type of project coming to the Planning Board. Uh, this is a parcel of land uh, just east of the uh, roundabouts on Bay Road. Uh, it's a one acre parcel. Uh, it is surrounded by a number of other parcels owned by the town, uh, totaling another 50 acres or so. And then it also then abuts uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, 220 acres or so of, of property that has this Alice, uh, Sweet Alice Trail uh, running through it. Uh, so this is the site here shown on the plan, uh, like I said, just east of the roundabout. Um, uh, Pam, if you want to go ahead to the next sheet, we'll get right into the uh, proposal here. Rob, just so you know, they're they're not in any order. So if I don't pick the right one, just let me know. Okay. Nope. This is it. There's only two sheets. Sheet two. Uh, so okay. this is uh, the proposed parking uh, layout on that parcel that was shown on the last uh, page. Uh, we're looking at 20 spaces, which, by the way, is a maximum. Uh, there's a potential, and Dave Zomek uh, did mention uh, in recent days that there's the potential to reduce this by a few spaces, which would pull the uh, the back edge of the lot to the north, uh, but otherwise be the the same design, but perhaps a few less spaces. Uh, but this is a 20 maximum 20 space lot. Um, there, the the finish on the lot will be all gravel TRG finish. Uh, with just with a paved apron at Bay Road to uh, to to comply with the curb cut standards that that the Public Works Department would require. Uh, up close to the road, there'll be a parking identification sign, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, and then there's a uh, working our way on the uh, uh, just said the, the the west side of the the lot. There's uh, what's shown there is a new stone dust, dust path. Now that path is uh, for future connection to a trail system that's being proposed right now through the Conservation Commission to run west to the Kestrel Land Trust property around the pond and uh, connect into that larger acreage uh, that I mentioned earlier. So that's just a, uh, an access point that we're just kind of, we're prepping for off of this parking lot uh, that will be part of a future project. Uh, both sides of the, the parking area will have a split rail fence uh, that's a detail that the conservation department is looking to have at, at these locations. Uh, at the back uh, south side of the lot, we're proposing three large boulders uh, just far enough back uh, in case uh, the staff decides to plow this in the winter time, uh, leaving enough room for snow storage, but preventing vehicles from driving off of the, uh, the gravel parking area. Uh, you'll see on the uh, south side that there's another area shown in stone dust material, uh, which is the going to be the new access to the Sweet Owls Trail, which is shown way down on the, the bottom right corner. Uh, the existing trail just yep right through there, continue straight out to the uh, Bay Road. So we're going to tie into that, connect into that around that point there. Uh, and, and create a fairly level but uh, solid firm surface to connect into that trail. Uh, back at the parking area, um, I don't know if you want to be able to zoom in a little bit, Pam, to that, uh, what, where the kiosk is uh, down to the south there to the bottom of the page. Uh, there'll be a kiosk. Uh, this is a, a standard kiosk uh, that the conservation department is installing at all the 
uh, trail and recreation locations uh, for right there. Yeah, right there for uh, various signage or notification or uh, information about the location that uh, that uh, you're visiting. Uh, just behind that, uh, there'll be a couple of uh, our standard 24 inch bike loops, steel bike loops uh, set in a concrete uh, footing yeah. uh, right there. Thanks, Pam. Um, and then you'll see that right at parking space number 10 is the uh, accessible parking space that'll receive a sign uh, with the uh, loading zone just to the south of it. Uh, this uh, proposal is, is made under uh, section 3.335 of the zoning bylaw. Uh, this is our, our section for public uh, parks and recreational areas. Uh, and we are going to be asking for a, a number of waivers. Uh, so if you could kind of scan over, uh, scroll over to the side cam, please, to the, to the uh, pictures. Uh, so there, there are uh, two signs, uh, one being the kiosk. If that's considered to be a sign, it will have uh, notifications posted on it that could change. Uh, but the back side is intended to have information about the location. Uh, this is a kiosk that was recently installed at one of the uh, other uh, trail locations on Stanley Street. Uh, the, the second image there in the middle, which is uh, just showing a signpost, that's the, the just showing an example of the signpost that uh, the Conservation Department would like to install out by the road to uh, uh, identify the parking area and the trail. And, and the bottom uh, two images are the same image, just in different colors. Uh, that's the sign that would be proposed to be hung from that wooden post out by the street, uh, two-sided sign. And uh, you can see they haven't made a choice of color yet. So I put the two of them in there. Uh, they, the bylaw allows for one sign, uh, I'm sorry, allows for two signs, uh, but up to a maximum of 12 square feet. So what we're proposing here is uh, going to require a waiver because of the, si the size of the kiosk and the size of the sign out by the road uh, combined will exceed the 12 square feet. Uh, we're also asking for a waiver for that sign post, although it does say four feet high there, it's actually gonna be six feet high or would like to be six feet high after I uh, discuss that further with Dave Zomek. Uh, so the top of the sign would be proposed at uh, uh, six feet. So we have a uh, waiver request for uh, signage under article eight, 8.5. And specifically it's section 8.101, uh, which has the maximum 12 square foot uh, limitation and we're proposing up to 24 square feet uh, between the two signs, including the kiosk. And uh, section 8.103 uh, is the, uh, the, the provision that limits the height of the sign to four feet off of the ground. And we're asking for that to be increased to six feet. Uh, back over to the parking pan, if you would scroll back. Uh, mm -hmm. We're asking for waivers on the parking area as well. Uh, section 7.9 uh, uh, waiver request will include three, three specific waivers. Uh, one is under seven, section 7.104 for parking space delineation. So like I mentioned, this is in gravel, uh, trap rock, uh, finish, some stone dust where it needs to be, uh, you know, smaller aggregate and smooth around the accessible spaces and the walkways. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult to maintain striping in, in the, this type of material, although we do intend to paint it uh, initially, hoping to establish parking patterns. And we're going to test that out uh, 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 over on Stanley Street and see how that works. Uh, but it, it will only last a month or so, uh, maybe a little bit longer before it, it, it's worn away. Uh, but it is something that we're not necessarily looking at maintaining uh, long term. Uh, the second waiver request is under seven point is because of seven point one zero five, which is the lighting requirements. So we're not proposing any lighting to these uh, town trailhead parking areas. And the last one would be seven point one one two, which is the screening requirement for from the street. This is a wide open 
uh, clear view from the street. There's no no vegetation uh, out there that'll that'll be blocking the view at all. Uh, we um, are. Let's see. Um, I think that covers what I wanted to propose. So, uh, oh, I did have, um, there was, I, I think Tom might talk about this, but the DRB uh, comments were received and uh, I was able to incorporate most of them, uh, which included uh, relocating the access to the trail uh, in, a, in a location uh, further to the south, uh, back of the parking lot. Uh, there was a request for uh, a place to leave a bicycle. So we, we did go ahead and add a couple of our 24 uh, inch bike uh, loops. And uh, at that time when I was discussing this with the DRB, I really didn't have any details about the sign. And there is a very small wooden sign that marks the trail location now, which is very difficult to read. And it was a recommendation to uh, consider a, a, a more visible sign uh, for those passing by and trying to find it. Uh, and, and this, in fact, what the images that are on the plan that we looked at is, is what the, the Conservation Department is, is looking to do at all of their locations. Uh, there was one other uh, recommendation for uh, collecting uh, trash and recycling. Uh, this just isn't a location that at this time we're interested in, in having the receptacles there. We're hoping to encourage uh, uh, people that uh, bring any uh, uh, trash with them that they take it away rather than leaving it. But uh, you know, this is uh, one of the locations as you know, all of them through town that are uh, managed and uh, visited regularly by our conservation land manager uh, his assistant and the various um, seasonal staff uh, to, to maintain and keep uh, the area clean. Uh, so that that's all I have for the presentation and uh, happy to answer questions. Okay, hey, Chris, did we, did we get the DRB? Yes, you did, it was emailed to you. I'm sorry e that oh, it came okay. late. Well, let, well, I think it was emailed either yesterday or today. Okay, we'll, we'll let Tom uh, cover that. And then we'll also have uh, the site visit um, Let's see uh, recap by Debbie Doug. So maybe we start with Doug. Okay. Um, well, Chris and I ended up going to the site separately. So I can tell you, I, I saw the, the, this, where the Sweet Alice Trail came out to the road. I saw the area of the shoulder and beyond where the vegetation has been worn away because there's a lot of parking that's going on just along sort of parallel parking along the side of the road. Um, I agree that it's a, quite a, an open landscape. Um, I did see a sort of a moan old farm road that was a little bit east of where the Sweet Alice Trail came out. I, I wondered whether that was part of the site. Um, and I wondered also, I've never been on the Sweet Alice Trail and I don't know how far back, how far it goes or where it goes, but uh, I was kind of interested to think about how large this parking lot would be in relationship to the, to the property. So, um, Anyway, that's kind of what went through my head when I was there. Was anything like staked or anything like that? Doug, I, did, to give I, didn't you see, I didn't see anything. Okay. All right. Um, so I, I guess, is this connected at all to the project um, that is, uh, you know, uh, east of... Uh, of Atkins, that I forget which development that is, uh, Chris. Um, but if you, because there was another trailhead over there that we, they, they were talking about. Is yes, this... I think you're talking about the Epstein property. And we saw the Kestrel um, Land Trust was relocating their offices onto, the, onto that Epstein property. And they're hoping to have um, trails there. And the trail that goes towards the east that Rob showed you on the plan is going to connect to the trails that go through the Epstein property. But that connection hasn't been made yet. 
I was I was thinking about the subdivision. Like there were like eight lots, um, a li little bit south of. Oh no, it's not connected with that. No. Oh okay, all right. No, all right. That's all right. farther to the south. Yep. Okay. All right. Um. So hey, uh, Tom, would you be able to yeah, sure. down download the DRB report? Yeah, I mean, I think Rob did a great job of summarizing it as well. So I don't really have much to say other than that. If you had seen the plan previously, um, you would see all the changes that were actually made, which I think the DRB would be really happy about. Um, the concerns that were were raised were, um, you know, mainly in regard to what was presented last time, which you guys didn't see this time. So it's hard it's hard to really talk about them other than the, the improvements that were made. Um, and Rob went through the list. Um, obviously, signage was one. Um, those little white with red etched that that was the sign that we saw and we were asking for something more broad that could be seen perpendicular to the road so people could see that as they drive by that was one of the main requests the other one was about safety within the lot um the the current or the proposed uh, access to the trail at the time was on the uh that would be the east side yeah if that's facing north that's the east side um, and we felt that people would be more inclined to walk to the south and enter the trail through the bottom of the lot. So it was changes like that. Uh, the bike rack was a request, which is present, um, as Rob said, which we thought would be great because people will ride there, just hook up their bike and then go for a walk. And we thought that was a great um, add on. So thank you for doing that. Um, and, and then the marking of the of the parking lot is something we tried to talk about having options for, but that's really a challenge which you're clearly asking for a waiver for um because we do want this to be a permeable surface um so that that's a, a real challenge so unless there's some innovation in that area um I, I think our biggest concern was for the ada spot and making sure that that was um well marked in, in some some manner uh, to make sure that space was was always ready um and then obviously the trash versus carry in carry out and that's just really a matter of what um what the the um the town uh, prefers for this particular site so so those are the recommendations and i think um you know uh, this looks great as a as a response to that so we appreciate it so um uh, chris i i know this probably dovetails into this uh initiative um i believe the chamber or the bid you know in terms of like promoting tourism within Amherst. So now, you know, obviously having parking at these trailheads is important. Um, can you, are you, do you know what I'm talking about there, Chris? I'm not that uh, familiar with that um, initiative. I know that the, the bid in the chamber have been trying to promote tourism um, all along. It could be that um, as a result of their recovery grant that they received, that they're um, putting an extra, you know, effort into that, but I'm not personally aware of that. Um, I'm sorry okay. to say. All right. Um, so thank you. And uh, so we can take uh, planning board comments. I see Janet. Um, so I, the first thing I wanted to say, Doug. I think these are very appropriate waivers. Um, you know, I, the compelling reasons of site design. I was worried when I was just looking at the, the sketches, I was like, this seems really, intense for a trailhead but the design that you put together is a trailhead it doesn't need lighting you know it needs a, a good sign but not you know a lit sign because you know you don't want to encourage people to go at night um so i think i think the waivers make perfect sense i think the sign is beautiful like the either color um i did have a question about the number of spaces because it seemed like a lot and i just you know is does this trail get a lot of use or is it expected to as it ties into kind of a larger network um yeah, and I also think like the spaces, it's not going to look that big from this from driving by or, or walking by because it's kind of in not super wide on Bay Road. But I just I just wondered about the thinking of the number. Rob. Yeah, so you know, as I mentioned, um, you know, we we started off, you know, was first asked uh, of me to come up with a twenty lot state uh, uh, parking area. But uh, Dave Zelmeck did mention that, uh, and this is in, this is being done in cooperation with the Kestrel uh, uh, Land Trust uh, managers there, uh, because I think there's 
there's not only the potential for the use uh, for the Sweet House Trail, but there's also the potential to go west and connect to what they have planned for future programming and activities uh, getting into their property. So it'll, it'll serve both functions long term. So the maximum of 20 spaces is, you know, I think what was originally envisioned for that. I can say uh, from my experience, which is not a lot at all uh, for these trail uh, locations, this is a very busy location. Uh, it's not unusual to see cars lined both sides of the street. And, and if you've been by there, you'll see how it is worn uh, even on the north side of, of Bay Road. Uh, so, you know, we're hoping to clean that up and, and make that, um, you know, grass again and less look less uh, desirable for a parking or likely to be used for parking. So uh, I, this is really taking David uh, Zomek's recommendation of a 15 to 20 lot uh, parking space uh, need here. It also seems much safer to be larger than having cars parked along Bay Road. So that, that makes sense. Okay. So yeah, I mean, the, other, the other thing, yeah, I was going to just comment on that, that um, as you drive along Bay Road, you'll also see other smaller parking lots along that way, because the Sweet Alice Trail is actually just, you know, one end of, of an access point to a whole network of lower trails uh, on the lower end of um, throughout the range. So from that point, just like you would from the visitor center, which is a lot that you know, at 10 a.m. on a Saturday is full, and that has, I don't know, maybe 40, 50 spots um, that you can imagine people who want access to that main trail network would also find this as a really safe and nice place to park because the other spots are always overloaded and only two or three spots to park there. So, so I think it's convenient and I think it would really serve um, access to, to a wide range of trails there. Great, so we have Doug and then Johanna. Doug? Okay, yeah, I had, uh, I guess, a couple of questions and one comment or suggestion. Um, first of all, I, I'll just make all my comments and then, Rob, you can respond to whichever's. Um, first was, why would the kiosk be counted as a sign? Um, I guess maybe I don't understand the signage bylaw well enough, but, you know, it seems really far set back from the street. It's not really part of your perception as you drive by. So why would that be included uh, in the in counting square feet? Um, and then the second thing was if this, if the approach you're pre presenting with this six foot sign um, and maybe the kiosk is the first installation of a whole series of installations, uh, you know, should we be talking about this as approving a system to be applied in multiple places in town. So you don't have to come back for every single one of these and you know, have this conversation. Um, and then uh, lastly, I was just a little bit puzzled whether the gravel surface is, is allowed by ADA or Mass Access Board. And um, you know, what the, what the uh, situation is with that and uh, then the comment I had was, I have seen gravel parking lots where at the sort of edge of the lot at each of where there would normally be a stripe, they will put a like a short granite post or a little wooden post to just give you a sense of the nine foot spacing that you're using and, and, and sort of encourage, give people a guideline a guy, a marker to encourage them to efficiently use the lot. So I wondered if you'd thought about that. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Rob. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Doug. Um, I wanted to be uh, as careful as I could with the kiosk. Uh, it is in plain view from the road, and it, as they're being installed, are just a a, a blank backboard. So I don't really know exactly what potentially it could be used for messaging or whatever could be put on there possibly could be viewed from the road. Maybe this is a little far away, but in other locations that I'm seeing, um, you probably could read it from the road. So, you know, based on our, our definition in the bylaw, it really is anything that's trying to provide uh, some sort of a message or 
um, in, invitation to the area or location of some sort. So I just wanted to be, you know, make sure I had that covered just in case, um, you know, uh, it turns out to actually be more of a sign for advertising purposes uh, for, for the location than, than possibly not. I do know that on the back side, which would be away from the road, the intent is to uh, have some information about the location, uh, history and some, some information for people visiting. Uh, so the surface, the, the gravel uh, does comply with AAB standards. So, you know, we're using a small three eighths aggregate uh, that is compacted, rolled uh, and, and becomes very tight and firm. Uh, it, it, it does meet that standard. Uh, I'm looking at probably doing a, even a smaller uh, aggregate at the parking air, the handicapped parking area and the uh, access to the trail out of stone dust material just to finish that off. Uh, but it is, it is used, it's commonly used for rail trails and a variety of uh, uses for, uh, for public use that can meet accessibility requirements. Uh, the conservation department knows that it's a maintenance item, uh, so it isn't just you know something that's going to be uh, good to go for year after year after the winters. Uh, so they'll probably be touching it up, uh, you know, every year and uh, uh, making sure it's in compliance. Um, so that's the AAB. Um, the last uh, what was the last? Sorry, what was the last? Uh, Kind well, of, I had the suggestion yeah. about the post at oh, the post. nine foot spacing. And then I also had the question whether we should be thinking of this signage as a system that we could ap approve for multiple uses throughout town. Yeah. So the, um, the, the, the system for multiple uses would be probably a good way to approach it. The sign designs just came in uh, a day ago uh, when I received them. So I think we're still, you know, I think they're still refining that and finalizing it. Uh, and once they're they're firm on that, I, I think the, the goal would be to take it to at least the DRB as a system signage uh, program. And then, you know, we'll have to decide location to location. You know, it may or may not need planning board review. If it's the only thing happening, there could be uh, administrative approval of the signage uh, in certain cases. Uh, you know, but I think, you know, when I understand that better and how many locations, then we can, we can think about what the best way or efficient way to approach that. This just came up at this time of the application. In fact, when I made the application initially, I didn't have any of the signs included because I didn't, I didn't have that information. I was just going to ask to come back later, uh, but they, but they did just come in. So the markings at the, the, uh, the parking spaces, I've seen a number of uh, attempts to to do something with a gravel parking lot. None of them seem to really work too well. Um, what you're talking about, something very low, you know, that's uh, at the head of the space, concerns me a little bit because it's, it's possible that the department, the conservation department will wanna plow these and maintain them uh, in the winter time and have access to them. So that's certainly something that's gonna be difficult to work around or, or they're going to get damaged. I was thinking more like, um, if there, first of all, if there's a problem, and like I said, we're going to test this out at another site with putting the paint down, letting people, you know, hopefully get used to it or see how parking is uh, is happening, uh, and see if we need to do something more permanent. But possibly using the fence posts as those indicators, uh, you know, would be a way to, to go about it here. Uh, in another location, I tried spacing out rocks, boulders at the head of the space, but it didn't really work out too well because they were they were so different in sizes uh, that it didn't really accomplish what we're looking for. So it's something we're still trying to figure out what's going to be best, um, but I'm hesitant to put something in too permanent that will cause, um, you know, more work for the maintenance staff to repair and uh, possibly be damaged from snow removal. Thank you, Rob. Uh, we have Johanna. Thanks, Jack, and thanks, Rob. It's exciting to see these plans. Um, I, I guess I have a couple of comments and then I have one question. So um, on the comments, I've seen the kiosks kind of pop up in different conservation areas all over town. And I think that consistency is really great. It like 
you know, signals to residents like, hey, there's a public resource here that you can go check out. And, you know, I've seen them at Stanley Street and at Kiwanis Park and other locations. So I think the consistency of that is going to help with the just overall wayfinding for residents and potentially for tourists. So those are exciting steps. And then I think the signs fit into that category too. And, you know, I think the sign that you showed us is consistent with the signage and some of the imagery that we approved for Kendrick Park playground and that, you know, we've seen in other signs. So I'm just excited about the direction that that's going in. Um, and then in general, I think, um, you know, the other day I drove by Sweet Alice and suggested to my kids that we go for a walk. And then we were like, where do we park? And they were like, ah, you know, no mom, like we don't want to go on an adventure. So I do think that there's something about legitimizing the parking area that is going to make access that much more available to people. And that's really exciting. Um, my last comment is um, I'm excited that you're doing the painting experiment at the Stanley street parking lot. Um, I it's, you know, continue to be kind of willy nilly there. And I think, you know, probably 80% of the users of the parking lot are frequent users. So if you get them doing the right pattern, I bet you can help create the culture that then kind of becomes self-perpetuating. So I'm excited about that process. Um, and then my last question, or my last, my question is, you had mentioned um, fencing on both sides of the parking lot. But in the schematic that Pam pulled up, I only saw fencing on the west side. So did I miss that, or is it? Is there? Yeah. Are you planning on doing fencing on the east side too? Yeah, and I don't know if Pam, if you want to bring it back up, but yeah. it is shown. It is shown on both sides. Um, if Pam can grab that plan, I'm trying. Hold on. Sorry, Pam. <laughs> All right. So is it this one? No. Yes. Yeah. So. So, um, yeah, if you could zoom in a little bit, Pam, anywhere in the middle, we find. Oh, okay. Um, so it's about, it's about five or six feet off of the edge of the parking spaces on both sides. Mm -hmm. I think if you look further to the west, that other line is erosion control uh, limit of work. So it's that, uh, that thinner line with the, with the circles spaced out every eight feet or so. Yep, uh, I read the map wrong. Thank you. Okay. okay. Right here and here. We're good. We're good. Thank you for answering that question. So uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm wondering in terms of access to the uh, Mount Holyoke trails from the Amherst side, will this be? I mean, other than the notch, um, will this be one of the first on on Bay Road that's kind of like formal like this? Because I know, you know, there's a path up to the water tanks um, further down Bay Road, but that doesn't seem uh, you know, like a formal parking area. So I'm just trying to get the lay of the land here in terms of access to um, the range there, Rob. Yeah, so this is going to be the first formal parking area. So I mean, just so far, what I've been asked to look at, you know, they're all pretty rough. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it seems some of them were uh, possibly uh, areas that were carved out with equipment at one time, perhaps others are just like what you see here, just cars pulling off the edge of the road. Uh, the, the parking area that's further to the east on Bay Road uh, that has a very steep incline off of the road, um, Tom might know the, the, the trail that the location that that is called, but um, that's another one we're looking at doing an improvement to with a much smaller lot, you know, maybe six or yeah. eight spaces. And then, as you mentioned, Jack, around the corner at the um, at the new subdivision, that's another uh, small parking area that is being provided to us, given, I guess, uh, set up by the developer of that, um, that yeah. project. And all of those have this connection. So the Sweet House Trail... If you go to the GIS, you'll see how far it actually expands. And it's, you know, there's a couple hundred acres of state uh, property that abuts the, the 50 acres of townland and um, connects to the Robert Frost Trail and others in, in the area. So it's a really, uh, uh, this is a really, um, uh, has a lot of potential for a access to a big uh, network of trails. Yeah, and I, I know our master plan, this was a focus to, to, to increase access to the, you know, wonderful trail system that we have in town. So this is great, I think. 
Um, any other comments uh, from the board? I see none, we can uh, open up to the, uh, the public. Any the attendees have any comments? I see none. Um, anybody want to, uh, you know, move this forward? I will so move to okay to um, approve the SPR twenty twenty two oh one for the Sweet Alice Trail. And there's some uh, yeah you want to uh, uh, Chris you want to. Yeah. Um, smooth so, out some of the, the motions here. <laughs> yes. um, would you like to close the public hearing and um, uh, find that this um, application meets the relevant criteria of section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw, along with um, the approval and also approve the waivers? And do you have any conditions that you would like to um, impose? Okay. Well, I will move to close the public hearing, step one. All right, I'll, I'll, uh, Johanna. I will second. Okay. So uh, for the discussion, um, deliberation period here, uh, do we want to apply any uh, additional conditions? Um, to what was stated, it looks like the waiver was, Rob was, with the, the height of the sign. Um, is that it? And so the sign. Oh, sorry. There, yeah, okay. There's So there's two sets of waivers uh, for, the, for the signage. It's uh, the square, the total square footage between the two signs and the height uh, increasing from four feet to six feet to the top edge of the sign. Uh, the waivers for the parking under seven, uh, Article Seven include the the parking space delineation, lighting, mm -hmm. and screening. Okay. Um, so, any other discussion from the board? Any motions? Do you want me to state a motion, and someone can say they move what I said? That would be um, wonderful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, you would want to move to close the public hearing and to approve the application and to find that the project meets the criteria of section 11, the relevant criteria of section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw, and that you approve the waivers um, requested and that you don't um, impose any conditions. I think that's it. I will so move. <laughs> All right, Janet, um, I'll second. So any further discussion? I see none. So we'll do a roll call here. Um, uh, Doug? Aye. And Tom? Aye. Uh, Janet? Yes. And myself is I and Johanna? Aye. Okay, so that's five zero with regard to um, approving this proposal. Great, so uh, next we have a continuance, uh, SBR 2021-11 Greenfield Savings Bank uh, at uh, University Drive. We discussed this previously on July 7th, 2021. Uh, this is a request for site plan review approval under section 5.043 drive-through facilities of the zoning bylaw to install an ATM as an accessory, accessory use to the existing bank um, authorized under section 3.358 of the zoning bylaw, including minor grading and paving with the, uh, within the existing parking area. And this is map 13B uh, parcel 20 and it's in the BL zoning district. Um, do we have a presentation? Chris? We have uh, Mr. Loind here from the Greenfield Savings Bank, Jim Loind, and I think okay. he may be joined by Tony Gleason, who's one of the owners of the property. So Pam may want to bring him 
over as well. All right. So um, we'll do, Doug, uh, did you do a site visit? Yes. Uh, Chris and I met out there yesterday evening. Okay. So we, we can do that later then, Chris? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. After the, after the, uh, um, hello, Mr. Lloyd and, and um, Mr. Gleason. You can unmute yourselves and uh, I'm not sure if you have slides or what, but uh, so let us know. Yep. Hi, good evening, folks. Uh, also, I believe in the waiting room was uh, Tony Wonsecki, who is representing the bank as our site planner. My last communication with him, I believe he was also here. We don't Sorry, see Tony. I don't see his name nor a telephone call in. Okay. So, uh, Jim or Tony, you you get the balls in your court uh, to. Okay. Um, uh, we have to kind of refresh. Uh, July seventh seems like a long time ago. <laughs> sure that. Um. So I guess where, where I'll pick up is, uh, as I mentioned, July 7th, the, the bank wants to install this drive up ATM uh, in addition to the convenience and 24 hour access for people, um, our customers, as well as the community. We also, uh, in the beginning phases, uh, thought of this as an additional way for people to do their banking uh, while maintaining safe social distancing uh, with the pandemic still not over and unsure of um, what different variants are, we're going to face. Uh, we'd like to proceed with this uh, so that again, there, there are some folks that just um, aren't yet comfortable coming inside and would like to provide them with the additional opportunity uh, to conduct banking. Um, <clears throat> there were some questions that were brought up that um, I've, I've done some research and I've tried to uh, address the concerns. Um, the, one of the questions was regarding um, the illumination at night. And I did provide uh, some pictures. While we don't have another drive up kiosk that will mimic this one. We have a walk-up ATM in Greenfield. And uh, the good and the bad is the only evening after dark that I had free in the last month that seemed to be raining. So um, I did just bite the bullet the other night and took some photos in the rain, which uh, they do provide. Um, and I, I submitted the pictures. But there is a lot of glare that shows, and I think it um, it makes the the illumination look even brighter than it is. So, I guess with pun intended, I'd say what I'm presenting doesn't put the uh, the lighting in its best light. Um, but that um, means to bring those up. Yes, if you yes. could. Okay. So yes, this is, this is our location at the Rotary in Greenfield where 91 and Route 2A intersect. And um, I thought it was a, a fair representation uh, because the, the location that we're looking for at the intersection of Amity Street and University Drive, there is also uh, street lights which illuminate the area um, as they do here. And as I said, this, this is, has a lot of glare uh, because of the rain that was in the air. Um, but pursuant to that, I also talked with the manufacturer of these units, which is Heritage. Um, and I believe they're out of Nebraska, but the first answer I got was that um, with the concern of the brightness, they could, they could adjust the, the, the intensity of the light 
by um, controlling the opaqueness of the vinyl that goes over the, um, the sign. And I actually did hear today, they had a follow-up question with an engineer who did indicate that they could in fact uh, install a dimmer. Um, so the, lumen, the lumens and the brightness can both be controlled to, um, to bring that down um, if needed in the future. And uh, for, for a small additional cost, uh, it'd be my recommendation to the bank that we have that dimmer installed. Because in addition to the, the convenience and the safety measures, we you know, would like to maintain that we're a good neighbor and we're a good part of the community. So we'd like to make that feasible. I wonder, uh, can Pam run through the other images that mm -hmm. Mr. Lloyd sent? There are a number of images. Thanks. So the other question that was brought up was they wanted to, uh, there was a question if I could have a computer model um, made up of um, how the kiosk would look. If, Pam, if you could just back up just maybe one slide. Thank you. Uh, I did check with both our site planner and with the manufacturing company and a few other resources. And I wasn't able to get a two scale rendering um, or a computer simulated model. And I apologize for the crudeness of this model, but I wanted to at least provide something um, to the board. So I'm not the most creative person in the world, but with some furring strips and contractor's paper, I did make this uh, to scale. And uh, this is from the uh, corner closest to Amity Street. And I also had it from the northeast and northwest corners of the intersection. Uh, so that you could get a feel for um, how it would look in relation to the grading and um, the mounds that are there. Um, so the, the structure itself, uh, this, this does account for the six inch curbing as well as um, the height of the unit and the height of the, the Lexon panels and the sides on the top. Um, and if we could just go forward, uh, this is a representation of uh, the drive up kiosk that we have as part of our Northampton King Street location. And this was just recently um, reskinned with new vinyl uh, that does have our new logos in the lighter shades on it. And I uh, wanted just to provide you with an additional uh, understanding of you know, what it would most likely look like. Now, of course, you know, in consideration of um, sign restrictions and everything else, obviously um, the graphics um, with our marketing department, they're, you know, they're adjustable and nothing, we don't have a finished product on what the final graphics would look like other than they'd incorporate our name and our logo. And um, at the last meeting, uh, Tony Wonsecki did, uh, provide some cut sheets um, of what um, the proposed unit would look like. <clears throat> so and I guess the last thing I wanna point out is that the reason that we chose that location in the parking lot was for safety. We did look at some other locations, but <clears throat> in terms of ac access and egress in and out of the drive up, um, this provided it was the most out of way location with regard to the rest of the parking and the rest of the tenants and also had the best sight lines for egress uh, when um, vehicles were leaving the queue. So I believe those were, oh, the other question that was brought up, uh, Doug did bring it up at the last meeting and uh, we got a little bit off, but he did ask about, uh, security cameras uh, for the safety of people in the area. And uh, there, there are uh, in designs to have in, in the machine itself, there's a camera that would look at 
the person using the device and as well as a camera overhead that um, gets a broader overview picture as well as the license plates of the vehicles you know should somebody uh, approach the the kiosk you know with some ill intent um, would be able to gather you know, information from the vehicle for evidentiary purposes later um, so for the safety of um, our patrons and the community that there are uh, plans for security um, i wonder if pam can just run through the rest of these pictures because i think it shows it from different angles thanks so uh jim is, is there going to be a canopy um as part of this? Yes. Um, if, okay. if in the last uh, in the last meeting we did have some cut sheets, and I don't know, um, I have the paper in hand now, and I believe Tony Wanseki had provided some on the meeting of the seventh, which showed there is an overhang to uh, this particular kiosk in Northampton doesn't have the overhang or the canopy because it's already sheltered with the rest of our drive up lanes. I see. But there is a, um, you know, the, the canopy with um, the clearance for um, height, which uh, it looks like, you know, the height clearance is eight feet and the canopy height, um, is an additional uh, 20 inches, which are the Lexon, uh, Lexon panels overhead. Okay, yeah, I, I'm not seeing that on your site plan, but. Um... Chuck, are, are you looking at documents from July 7? Because I think yes. I have those. If you need yeah. me to bring them up, I can give it a go. Yeah, oh, the, okay. I'm looking at the July 7 package. Okay. And yeah, it doesn't look like there's a canopy. Um, so um, perhaps, you know, you provide that, you know, additional detail. Um, can you show the image, Pam, from July 7th? I can try. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Can you share the PDF? Does someone need to take this share down? Oh, I'm working on it, Chris. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have it as page 12. There you go. Right here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This doesn't show the canopy though. So if you continue no. to scroll through, you can see the canopy. Okay. That's it. Right here. So that overhead section that is indicated on the left by um, says it's 20 inches in height. Uh, is the canopy. And I, I believe if you scroll down one more, uh, it shows the side view. Yeah, uh, okay. So I'm not really considering that as a, like a, I can't, you know, uh, I was thinking, I was looking at the photos that you presented for the Greenfield ex example, and then looking at this. But it's going to be as we see right here. Yes. And and not with a real like like where where you go in a gas station and you have no you know, thirty feet of roof over. Um, no. You know, where, yeah. Okay. I I apologize. No, it's yeah enough to uh, sort of shield the the user from the elements, and I believe it shows on the screen that the the overhang is thirty six inches. Okay. So. Gotcha. Thank you. Sure. So, uh, our, should we open it up to the the board if you're if you're uh, complete, Jim? Or 
Yes, well, Dominic. yeah, and I was just going to say that uh, Mr. Gleason is here as well. I know that the board had requested his attendance. They had some questions that were uh, they wanted to direct to him. So okay. I saw, I, if the board has any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Very good. So um, open it up to the board. General questions. Uh, Doug? Yeah, I, I, uh, Chris and I did do a site visit there yesterday. Yeah, please. Yeah, so please give us a site. And visit. Uh, yeah. you know, we met with Jim and with uh, Tony, his and his engineer. Um, had I think Jim accurately conveyed the conversation we had. Uh, Tony had marked the curb locations on the pavement, so it was clear where the kiosk would be. And it fits very nicely into the existing, you know, extent of pavement. So, um, you know, it looked like it would work well. Um, one thing I, I noticed is that at the July 7th meeting, several of us had looked at Google Maps, uh, the street view to see what that site looked like. Uh, that must be an old, uh, old photo because uh, much of the vegetation between the, the kiosk and Amity Street has been removed uh, since that street view was taken. Um, so it's very open and visible from Amity Street, which, is, which uh, I think it was Jim that said he, they thought that was a good thing so that if there was any, you know, it would discourage people from, uh, uh, you know, having any sort of ill intent in the vicinity of this machine that dispenses money. Um, otherwise, I guess I don't really have anything else to, to add. Chris, if you have anything, go ahead and I'll stop there for the site visit. I, I know I do have a question or two, so uh, I can go on to that if Chris doesn't have anything. I just wanted to mention that the tree that is existing there um, will not be disturbed. There's not going to be any excavation done around the tree other than um, replacing the curb. So um, that, that was something that came up at the site visit. And also um, for Mr. Gleason, and this is a little bit outside of the um, realm of the application, but um, Mr. Marshall noted that there were some invasive exotic plants on the site, um, particularly uh, Euonymus, um, a lattice, which is a plant that is considered to be invasive exotic. So he um, was going to recommend, I think, that uh, the, the owners of the property look into removing those plants at some time. But that's not something that Greenfield Savings Bank has any control over. We would be agreeable to that. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Doug, I let you continue. Okay, well, the, the, we, Chris uh, spoke about the, the question I had, which did, did concern the, uh, the, the, the euonymus, also known as burning bush. Um, I saw, that, you know, some of those had shown up in the Google Earth view right next to where the kiosk was to go, and I see those have been removed. Um, there are obviously a, a number of other uh, uh, specimens of that, of that species on the property. And uh, I know I've had a lot of personal experience with digging up volunteer uh, burning bushes. And so I, I would, you know, encourage you to, uh, to, to think about taking those out, um, you know, on whatever timeline you can manage. Um, and then uh, otherwise, I don't really have any comments. I think um, I was uh, much more reassured by the site visit um, that, you know, this is a reasonable thing to do. So uh, I appreciate uh, us continuing the hearing and I appreciate having the site visit. Tony? Oh, I, I was just going to say that um, we're happy to remove the burning bushes on a relatively short timeline. Um, you know, in general, the removal of shrubs and, and bushes are sometimes frowned upon. So, um, you know, your suggestion to remove them, we share the same opinion and uh, we're happy to do it. We were just treading lightly with that. So we will get going on that in short order. 
Very good. Any other uh, comments from the board? Janet? So at the last hearing, Doug had raised the question about the light being, the sign being very bright and prominent um, on that corner. And so I did drive by there at night. It is kind of very, a dark kind of corner. And so I, I thought the idea of maybe making it more opaque on a dimmer might be good and not have such a kind of glaring kind of white light, you know, as kind of the beacon of new market center it might be a, a good suggestion just to kind of tone it down. So the sign is visible, but it's not, you know, kind of flashing at you or the, the thing that you see and nothing else around it. So I'm not sure how that would work, but, you know, maybe like making it less bright white and maybe not as bright would be a little more in tune with the, the, the vibe of the whole corner or the whole thing at night. <clears throat> Yeah, so maybe Rob, I mean, I know, I know you guys talk about a dimmer, but how does that, you know, in, in, in uh, practice, how, how will that get resolved? That the lighting is, I mean, want it to be right. Well, um, I'm sorry. Well, I, let, let, let me call on Rob if, if he can speak to that. Yeah, so, you know, there might be ways we could do it that, you know, don't involve complicated controls, you know, maybe it's simply the, the fixture, the, you know, the wattage, the, 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 the color, all of that could be looked at uh, first to see if there's something that wouldn't be as, uh, as glaring bright white, um, you know, but I think without any specific, um, uh, you know, measurement or guidance on that, it would really kind of be in the field. Uh, turn it on and and start making adjustments uh, probably with the uh, the fixture itself. So yeah, so so the the dimmer aspect is is something that um, is um, you know acceptable to. Um, I'm not sure that would be a condition, but um, it sounds like it's it's a something that we're concerned about. Uh, if I may, just uh, I I do agree with Janet's comment that you know, it, especially when you look at the photos from our Greenfield location with you know with the glare from the rain and everything else, I even I agree that it would you know it would be obnoxious, for lack of a, a better word in the in the moment, and um, that's I'll go back to my point that. We want to be good neighbors and good community members. We don't want to stick out like a sore thumb and be um, a beacon, so to speak. And um, I, th I thought it was an, a good potential answer when they um, Heritage talked about adjusting the opaqueness of the vinyl to dim it down. But like a, what I was told today, uh, LED panels, you do have the ability to adjust the lumens, to adjust the intensity. Um, and by installing the dimmer switch, sort of, I think if I understand what Rob said, uh, sort of an in the field thing, we can work with it and make adjustments as necessary to find uh, a level that's satisfactory. Okay, so and, perhaps we can make that a condition uh, that Rob Mora, um, you know, eyeballs this and, you know, works with Greenfield Savings Bank in terms of the, the intensity uh, with regard to the dimmer uh, switch. Uh -huh. So something like um, that Greenfield Savings Bank will work with the building commissioner to adjust the uh, level of brightness of that canopy. Is that? The, yeah, so that, that, that's a, it'd be, a, you know, acceptable. We, we can trust Rob that, uh, <laughs> um, it's appropriate, but yeah. If I can, um, just to for you know full transparency, and I don't want it to be thought that I intentionally left something out, but there's um, two comp two lighting components. There's the Lexon panels that have our logos, which are the outward. There is also some recessed downward lighting. Um, that would show on the vehicles at night and um, illuminate 
the area and that and those the down lighting is fixed and that's for security and safety purposes. Yeah, that seems reasonable. So it's more the you know the horizontal panels that you have. So um anybody on the board have other comments uh, in that regard? Okay, let's open it up to the public. Any any uh, comments from the public? I don't. I see none. So back to the board. Someone want to make a, a a motion with one condition that we mentioned. Uh, closing the public hearing. Uh, Doug. Yeah, I'll move that we close the public hearing, that we accept the, the uh, applicant's application with the additional con condition that they work with the building commissioner on adjusting the brightness of the canopy to, to where it's uh, a sensitive element in the, in the, on the site. Very Thank good. You. Are you going to find that this application meets the uh, relevant criteria of section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw? Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> Johanna. I'll second that motion. Okay, any further discussion amongst the board? Uh, I see none. So let's just do a roll call. Um, uh, Doug? Aye. And Tom? Abstain. Uh, Janet? Aye. And Johanna? Aye. And I'm an I. So that's four zero with one abstination. So thank you, Jim and Tony. Thank you very much. I appreciate thank your you. time. Yeah, thank you. So next we have um, a zoning bylaw. It's a continuance uh, for the uh, changing of the official zoning map for map 14A, parcel 33 uh, off of North Prospect Street uh, to see if the town will vote to amend the official zoning map to extend the general business district to include a vacant parcel of land owned by the town of Amherst in the vicinity of North Pleasant Street North Prospect Street, Cows Lane, and Amity Street, uh, currently located in the General Residence District RG. So who, um, who do you have uh, presenting this, Chris? George Ryan is here. He was one of the proponents, so I think he intends to speak to you. Okay, George, you, you, you have the floor. All right, uh, Jack, thank you. Good evening to uh, members of the board. Um, you have in your packet, I don't know if you've had a chance to read it, but we've provided um, a series of uh, responses to the questions from the last meeting. Uh, we tried to cover all the questions that uh, we felt we could provide uh, reasonable answers to. Um, and I don't know if you uh, want me to go through that. I think that is hopefully something that you have access to. Um, what I, I, I to, think I, I would I wouldn't mind if you did, George, because it's just a refresh. Uh, we've had so much going on the last month. Um, okay. Okay. It would definitely help me personally. Um, okay. Okay. And, and I know you only got it today, so and I apologize, but uh, just as you, so we too, Evan and I, Ben. <laughs> yes. Busy, but that's no excuse. Um, so yes, I'd be happy to go through it briefly. Um, I just want to, before I start through this, I want to uh, just reinforce what I hope we made clear last time that again, this is just the very, very first step of a long and complicated process, but without this first step, nothing else can happen. And so we would like something, Evan and I and others, uh, particularly, principally the, the business owners in the downtown business district, the bid would very much like to see something happen. Um, and it's driven really by a sense of the changes that um, have occurred recently in the downtown are occurring right now and will be occurring in the next few years. 
So this is not so much about what is right now and certainly not about the past. It's about what is coming and will be coming. And it's it part of that uh, sense of a vision and a sense of a future coming out of COVID. And, and so that's what's driving this um, is, is that the parking garage uh, as we envision it would be a key piece of, of that much larger uh, vision um, and a, a much larger set of events that are happening around us. Um, I just sat down before the meeting and just started listing. Um, you know, the, the downtown, particularly today, it, it's as much about experience. People come downtown for experience and not uh, just you know, for one particular thing. And so offering them, so I just made a list of, of just briefly for a second, the kinds of things that right now are there and will be coming um, in our downtown and that a parking garage would be a place that um, would, people would know that would be a place where they could go. And then there would be many, many other things they could then do on foot as pedestrians, et cetera. So you think of the, of the Jones Library that, that we hope soon will be renovated and expanded, the Amherst History Museum, a world-class independent cinema. Um, there's a music venue that is planning to open above the high horse in October called the Drake. Obviously the very famous Emily Dickinson Museum and Homestead. Um, the, the Summer Comet uh, concerts that are taking place now in the South Common, um, a plan for a band shell a performance space that hopefully in the next year or two um, would be built on the South Common. Um, Kendrick Park Playground is gonna be opening soon and there's more developments planned in that area for that space. Um, the Amherst College Museums, the Pratt and the Mead. Um, outdoor dining was mentioned last time and the thought that, that going forward post COVID um, we would like to encourage that more, but to do that would require the loss of parking spaces. Um, but people coming downtown, um, Sweetser Park, um, and then really thinking far ahead, the, the fire station uh, we dream someday um, will no longer be a fire station. And what might become of that? Could that become also an experiential uh, place where some say for performance space for, for theater or, or, um, or such? So, and then just the developments that are going to be happening in terms of housing. Um, in the downtown. So there's a lot that has happened, is happening, and will happen. And we see this as part of that um, larger series of, 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 of happenings and a key part of that. Um, so that's, that's what's driving this. Um, so in the mem memorandum, um, we basically addressed a whole series of questions. First of all, um, why this lot, uh, as opposed to say the Amity Street lot or the Boltwood lot. And um, I don't think there's anything terribly new here but essentially we just go over the, the specifics. The Amity Street lot is much too small um, and uh, the neighboring lots are owned by other entities and uh, would be prohibitively expensive um, to acquire. And I don't think too many of us actually would like to see a parking garage right on Amity Street opposite um, uh, the, the, the library and so forth. It, so that was, with the, the vault would continues to be a, a place that I think some people think of, but um, things have changed in terms of the physical location. Um, it still seems to be clear that it's not something that really can be built up on. Um, and so, and it's also not a site that anyone has expressed any interest um, in actually developing. Whereas the, the uh, North Prospect Street lot is one that in fact, people have expressed interest um, in developing. We talked about the current situation, how many spaces, there are currently 72 spaces in, the, in that lot that the town has. Um, we list uh, the revenue that is uh, provided. Um, and thank you for putting that up on the screen. Um, and then I think something that, that everyone needs to think about is just the cost of maintenance. Uh, soon a, a very substantial maintenance bill is gonna come due and that will fall to the town. Um, there was an estimate done not too many years ago um, where the town estimate or town share was over $300,000. And that's an ongoing expense that will always be there um, in, into the future. Um, so when we think about um, weighing costs, that's something that needs to be um, considered in the overall calculation. Current usage of the lot is provided in the, uh, the next bit in terms of day and time and utilization. Um, okay. So if we just scroll down a bit um, in terms of um, use, again, Pre-COVID, I can think of many times uh, when I've come to use that lot on a Thursday, Friday, or Saturday evening, and it's been full. Um, obviously, in the last year and a half, it's been a very different story. 
Um, but these are some figures from the parking study of 2019, pre-COVID. It gives you some sense, some sense of, of some of the utilization of that lot. The next uh, section of the memorandum deals with the proposal itself and how it would go in terms of the process and where the public would be involved at, at every stage in this process. Um, and so it lays out um, the various uh, steps that, that would be um, a part of that. The next deals with the need, which I sort of introduced uh, already at the very beginning, sort of my preamble here um, stresses some of the things that I think are important uh, in terms of just the perception. We, this is not driven by some sense that there's a, there's a parking crisis in Amherst that we need to address. There's a perception crisis or perception problem, and this has been true for a very, very long time. And this is something that we hear from constantly from business owners in the downtown, um, that, that people who come to their businesses, come to their restaurants, come to their events, um, always lament that it's a struggle for them. Um, yes, they do find parking and, and there is parking, but it, it's a struggle. And, and so often they will say, I'm just not coming back. Um, and so we know, you use Northampton as an example. We all know that if you're going to an event, a music event, whatever it is, or dinner, you know there's a place you can park. You know, you always are looking for that, that space that will appear and sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't, but you know you can go to the, the municipal uh, garage and your car is taken care of and then you can just walk around and do what you need to do. Um, and right now, Amherst really unfortunately doesn't seem to have that. So, um, and then the rest of, the, of this paragraph really picks up on some of the themes that I have I've already introduced that we're thinking about the future. This is not about the present. It's not about some har parking crisis that we need to solve. It's about a perception and a future and a vision of what is coming um, uh, to Amherst and that this would be a key part or could play a key part in that, in that, in that uh, change and development. I also mentions, as I said, we mentioned last time, the idea of, of, of dining um, on the street. Um, so um, this is something that's become popular and uh, people are using it. Um, but once we go back to just putting cars in their usual parking spaces, that goes away. So the attraction, again, uh, part of the attraction of something like this is the cars are all in one place, um, out of sight, in the back, um, and it, it opens up the street for all kinds of possibilities. Um, so that was the idea of why is there a need for this. Um, what about other options presented in the parking studies? Um, actually, many of those are excellent suggestions. Uh, we're certainly not opposed to them. I believe Sean Mangano has been given the task of seeing if he can help implement some of those. Um, we think that they should be implemented, but they don't address uh, what we feel is the, the most important part of this, which is the perception issue and the idea of what's coming in the future and the demand that we hope will become increasing for people coming for experiential uh, events in our downtown, whether it's art or music or dining or just walking around in the, the green spaces that we're creating not just Kendrick Park, but in front of Town Hall, the North Common, and of course the South Common um, and Sweetser Park. Is it premature to rezone? Does it, wouldn't it make sense to first uh, have a, a project and then, and then rezone? That sounds eminently reasonable, but as, the, as this paragraph tries to explain, um, there's just no one is going to take the, the, the expense and the time uh, that would be involved um, to, to see, to come up with a, a, a proposal a real concrete proposal that we could then ask the kinds of questions that were asked last week or last time, last meeting in terms of, you know, look and size and, 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 and uh, traffic and entry, e egress and, and so forth. Um, no one's going to do that um, if the parcel remains RG. Okay, that's, that's the bottom line. Um, no one's going to take that time or expense and we don't want the town doing that. Um, the whole point behind this is that it would be a public-private partnership where the town expends basically nothing. Um, the risk is taken on by the developer and um, the town provides the land and maintains ownership of the land and, and writes up the RFP and has final say on, on, on what it will be. Um, and so this is, you know, and that, so that's our, the advantage to us. Um, and then expecting that somehow someone is going to uh, um, do all this um, without having some assurance that the zoning would allow it. I think it's just unrealistic. Um, and I don't think the town wants to take that expense on and we certainly don't want that. Final future potential, how many spaces? Again, that's a guesstimate. 
depends on the design, but we, as we've said, we're, we're looking at something three stories, at, at, that's it. Um, we're not interested in five story structure. That would not be anything that we would support and we would withdraw. And it's not something that would be in the RFP. So you're talking about a three story garage um, and given the slope of the site, um, it's very likely that um, the first floor, would, large, a good portion of it would be, would be uh, underground. Um, so one guesstimate is over 120, say 123 spaces. But again, without an actual proposal, um, we can't say for certain. And I don't think you're not going to get a proposal unless we take the first step um, and rezone. Um, then the specific concerns are addressed in terms of traffic, height, um, and so forth. Um, these are all good questions. We're not dismissing them. Um, but again, we're not bringing a concrete proposal to you because there isn't any. Um, but if you imagine um, what might be the case with traffic, that, that's a very good question. And I think that has to really be looked at closely. Um, and the concerns of the neighbors and would have to be taken very seriously. Um, so this would be something the ZBA would be looking at. It would depend on the proposal. Um, height, um, as we said, uh, yes, the BG does allow up to five floors, but that's not what we would, we would support. That would not be in the RFP. Um, and uh, also the expense of it would be prohibitive. Three floors is more than adequate. Um, and would also, I think, be in keeping um, with the, the, the homes across the street and with the, the, the buildings that are adjacent to it. Uh, other uses, again, the question is, well, you know, um, what if the parking garage, you know, no proposals come or we go through the process and we don't like the proposals and we say, okay, it stays, it stays a parking lot. Um, well, then now that it's BG, it could be, and anything could happen to it. And that I understand that concern, um, but first of all, remind everyone that it belongs, the land is still in the town's possession and whatever would happen there could only happen with the town's permission and ultimately with the permission of the town council. But we also was raised the notion of what's called contract zoning. And we looked into that. And I think in the next part of the, uh, in the next paragraph, I believe um, Evan addressed that or somewhere he addresses that, um, maybe it comes a little bit later, but we looked into contract zoning. It is legal in Massachusetts. It has been used. Um, and um, yeah, there it is near the end. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so it's certainly something that we would support. We would be perfectly happy to include that as part of the, of the zoning bylaw. Um, apparently the Lowe's in Hadley was done under some form of contract zoning. And um, it's, uh, I think Evan here mentions one case in particular. So it is perfectly uh, legal. It has to obviously address something that's the, some common good um, in, in, the, in the language. It has to be providing for something that is, that is a truly beneficial to, to the community as a whole, which we think this would be, um, but we would certainly be open to that. So it would be explicit in the language that this could only be uh, used as a, for the purpose of creating a garage and that would be it. Um, and so we'd obviously have to do some more homework there, but, but that is a, a very real possibility and one that we would support. Um, then up above, we go back up, we just, we look briefly at traffic, height, other uses, um, the viability, impacts the CDS, um, uh, basically none, um, they would still have their lot. Um, again, if this ever, if we did rezone it and uh, people did come forward and did take the time with their lawyers and conversation and doing, uh, their due diligence, I assume they would have conversations with CBS and they might be able to work out something um, more than just an overhang. I mean, one suggestion is just an overhang <laughs> over the CBS uh, 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 spaces, but CBS would keep their lot um, unless they chose to, to in, enter into some agreement that they, they would see as advantageous to them, but they may very well not. So the impact on them would, would not be any, as far as we could see. And impacts to other businesses, again, as described here, um, they have their own parking. Um, and again, um, maybe they would work something out or maybe they would just keep the parking they have, um, but it seems the impact on them immediate businesses would be, would again, not be significant. And the impact on all the other businesses in the downtown um, would be uh, very positive. Um, that's something we hear a lot. Um, and then again, as we said, is there any way to guarantee? And that's, that's kind of, I jumped ahead there, but that deals with the, uh, the issue of uh, what well, couldn't it then become, you know, once it's rezoned, it could become anything. Um, and that paragraph attempts to address that and contract zoning is part of that. 
So uh, that's in sum what uh, my colleague put together for you. Um, hopefully it gives you some clear sense of what um, we are hoping to accomplish long-term and how this is just the first step. And um, again, I just wanted to begin with that preamble of what drives this is, is a sense of, of a future excitement, what's happening in our downtown and what's gonna be happening in our community over the next few years. And um, uh, it's, we want it not to cost the town. It's not something where the town would be expending any money. And the, you know, the, the phrase is a win-win um, for the business community, um, which would be taking on the risk and the town, which would be providing a space that would draw people. They would know without that they have a place they can come and, and then they can go off and do whatever they wanna do. And as you can see, there are many, many, many things now and even more to come that you can do in our downtown. So. Thank you, George. Um, I'm not sure I've, I've, I've heard you give such a presentation and all your weeks and months of on the town council. <laughs> it was very nice, thank you, uh, very clear. Um, well, thanks to Evan. Evan is, uh, he's, can't, he's at a wedding. Uh, that young man, I don't know, he just, he needs to go to less weddings. I don't understand it, but uh, he's at a wedding again. <laughs> um, he was out yesterday getting a tux. Um, he, I can't fit into mine, I couldn't lend in mine. But um, uh, anyway, he did the lion's share here. Um, uh, but thank you, Jack. I'm sure. Um, so, so we need to be clear that we're not, you know, talking about a parking garage, but we're talking about rezoning. Uh, for this particular uh, hearing, um, but just being transparent that, you know, a parking garage proposal would be in, you know, in the offing there. Uh, so I, before I open up the board, I, I have a, a few questions that maybe Chris um, um, or Rob can, can help me with, but uh, I, did, I saw the graphic that the, the, Parking revenue was decreasing from 2015. Um, it was early on in, in, in uh, George's slides, but. Um, I can try and bring that back up if you give me a second. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I just, you know, COVID, we know, you know, last year mm -hmm. was, was low, but it just seemed. I was mm -hmm. curious what, mm -hmm. what would be. This one. There you go, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, 18, 19, I, I'm wondering what the town's perspective on, on that decrease from, uh, you know, subsequent to the fiscal year 17, uh, you know, there was like, that's a big drop. I just, I'm just wondering someone can give some perspective on that. Chris? I don't know anything about that. I'm sorry, I can't, uh, I don't have any information to share. Perhaps Rob does. I, I do not uh, either. Okay, that's fine. Um, and then also just to get some uh, more history perspective, uh, again, because this is uh, you know prior to every member on the board, uh, you know, joining, we had Boltwood. Uh, now I'm trying to understand why Boltwood uh, parking ended up being, you know, subterranean, but no, no stories above ground floor. Can we get some perspective on that? Do you want me to answer that? Yes, Chris. I was around then. Um, so there was a lot of objection from the residents of Clark House and Ann Whalen Apartments about having a structure in the middle of that open space. People seemed to really like the idea of having the open space, even though there were cars there. And um, so that was the primary objection. And there was also an architect who was involved, whose name I can't remember, but he spoke very passionately about maintaining um, the open space there and not filling it up with a building. Um, so even though a second story was, or a third, a third floor was planned initially, um, it was determined that that wouldn't happen at the time that the garage was built. But um, we did hear that the garage was designed to accommodate another story if the town were to decide to put one there. 
Um, I don't think there would be that many spaces that would be um, gleaned by doing that. I'm mm -hmm. thinking around 80 or 90, not exactly sure. Rob may have a better idea. Um, and I think if we were deciding to pursue that as a possibility, there would need to be some studies done <clears throat> about whether the um, structure, you know, meets today's code because this was designed back in the 90s. So Rob probably has uh, more information about that. Okay. I, I just, yeah, I, I'm curious about that because I, that, um, I always thought that was a missed opportunity for the town to, to make that a larger uh, structure. But, um, and then I totally agree with, with George, uh, with, you know, going to Northampton, you can like hunt and peck for a parking space, but you know, you always have that parking garage that you can go to and it would be wonderful, you know, have that same feeling comfort level, um, you know, given whatever time constraints you have, that you know you're going to find a parking place, uh, you know, within a within a parking garage. But again, that's we're not talking about a parking garage. We're talking about a zoning change. But I just wanted to to, to say that. And then, uh, Chris, I'm wondering in terms of a, a condition, can we can we limit this to um, a three story versus a five story? You know, with regard to the approval of this uh, and you know, putting a some sort of um, you know, kind of overreaching a little bit, but you you can make the recommendation. The planning board can make that recommendation if the planning board decides to um, um, recommend approval of this rezoning. That would be that could be part of your recommendation. Um, yeah, because this has to go through town town council. Yeah. Right, but when the RFP goes out. Um, whoever is in charge of that can also make that a stipulation in the RFP that the town wants a th no more than three stories here. So that okay. would be something that the staff would put together and the town manager would um, release that as an RFP for the town. Okay, uh, that's all I had. So I, um, open it up, I see Doug. Yeah, I had a couple of, uh, I guess, a couple of questions. One is, um, I, I guess at this point, we're just doing a rec. I mean, we're, we're going to make a recommendation to council, and then council is going to decide whatever it decides. Um, so my first question is, what was the vote of town council to refer this to us, how strong was the support on the council to to to, ref, to to refer this this proposal to us? And the second question I had was, if this proposal is is uh, rejected, I guess um, isn't there maybe a two year period during which it can't come back? So if we Kill, if we contribute to killing this, uh, are we in fact killing it definitely for two years? I think that the rule is that if the planning board um, puts it forward again, then it can come back, but um, it has to be, the recommendation has to come from the planning board to bring it back. That's my understanding. Thank you. Uh, George, you have your hand up and then Janet. My recollection, and it's rusty, so maybe we sh I should not say anything. But my recollection is the vote was eight to five. It was it was not like a, a unanimous or anything like that. There certainly were uh, some uh, objections, but my recollection it was eight to five. But I should I have to check. Um, I'd like to think it was higher than that, but I think it was eight to five. So so uh, what was it, George? Do you think? Well. I, I'm I'm nervous here. Um, I do know it was not it was not unanimous. I know that. Okay. Um, and um, so maybe I should just say I'll ch I should say to Doug I'll just find out and get okay. back to you. I will tell you. Um, that's the safest. Thank you, uh, Janet. So um, my concern I have a few concerns here. One of them is that. A zoning change 
with very little information. And so instead of planning first and gathering information and then zoning, we're being asked to zone without information or planning. And so um, it just seems at a minimum to get to get some drawings, some diagrams to show us the capacity of each of the parking lots um, to sort of compare them and to see how many spaces they could have given the setbacks and the different zoning um, things. I mean, you were, it seems like you've already have some by an architect and I would hope that you would share that with us so we could at least see you know, you're going to have two 20 foot setbacks um, on the north and south side because it abuts RG. You're going to have a 10 foot setback at the rear. Um, I don't think you're probably going to build right onto the street, onto North Prospect Street. And so to me, it looks like those options, the size of the garage can get smaller and smaller. Um, and you're hoping for like 100% lot coverage. Um, it sounds like no landscaping, it's just, you know, a brick there. Um, so I would like to see, you know, what's possible and what, how many spaces are possible. Um, I was looking at the, the study from 1990 that compared the Amherst parking facility study from 1990, and they had drawings of the possibilities on all three town lots. Um, they found 240 spots on the CVS lot, but it was the CVS plus the town lot. And that seemed sort of like a threshold number. And even at that number, you know, they were barely cut, making money. Um, and they were kind of different parts of the financial analysis. And of course the numbers are different now because 30 years have gone by. They might be worse because everything's more expensive and our parking rates aren't very high. They thought that basically, um, you know, monthly, monthly parking people were the best way, you know, people who rented by the month would be the best way to make money. So I would, I would hope that we would see some diagrams on each of the lots. I would like to see a diagram combining Amity Street and the Bank of America lot, because that's a lot of space. And in terms of like the look of the parking garage on Amity Street, I mean, it, you know, I think, you know, there was an original presentation um, in this parking study, they were talking about doing a line of shops in the front to kind of fill out the street, um, like retail shops and making that attractive. And throughout the parking study, every lot that they were looking at, they were looking at making it attractive and appealing and things like that. And so I would love, and I don't think it's super expensive because I know, I mean, yesterday at the site, I asked Chris Brestrup, can, can you do that? Can you do those? Because we've seen the planning department do it. We've seen Doug do it. And I, you know, the response was that there's just the planning department has no time, but it seems as a proponent and you have an architect that that wouldn't be hard to do. Um, also, this is a public hearing and the public it's, I mean, if I feel like I have very little information, I'm sure people paying attention to this feel the same way. Um, so, you know, diagrams to illustrate the capacity of each lot um, and the setbacks, because I think you might wind up with a much smaller um, parking garage given the 20 foot setbacks. Um, because it's BG adjoining RG. Um, the other question I have, I have a, a lot of questions, but one of them is, it's like, has anyone gone to the TAC, the Transportation Advisory Committee? There are people on that committee who have expertise in traffic and parking. And I don't think it's a small thing to have all the traffic coming in and out off of North Prospect Street. Um, I'm not sure it's gonna be obvious to people, but I, I know that's a lot of impact. And I was wondering if the TAC with all their experience, some feedback from them. I think I would like to have that before I make a recommendation. Um, and then, let me, do you, I mean, do you want to respond to that? Well, I, um, I don't know. Well, wanna... respond to which? All of the yeah, questions? Yeah, so, the TAC or which one do you want me to start with? Well, the TAC is the easy one, but the diagrams are the, I think, really important. Well, let's start with the diagrams. Uh, we don't have an architect. Um, we don't have a plan. Um, as I've said over and over again, um, no one is going to do this. The town's not going to do it. No architect, no, no uh, private entity is going to do this if it remains RG. Uh, and I've just explained in detail how we have protections here so that if, if this does not work, then it goes back to being what it's, and it goes also goes back to us spending another 300,000 or 400, whatever it is, uh, to patch it up, um, which seems to be a Lynn lost in the shuffle. So the risk and the cost falls on the shoulders of the private entity. And they will only do this if they see that it makes sense. I, I'm not so sure, sure they're about making money. Obviously they wanna break even, but the, the driving force here from the bid 
and from those who probably would take the, the risk would be the, what I've described from the beginning is a desire to create a, a place that people want to come to. It's not about making yourself rich on a parking garage. Um, you do want to make break even, but I don't think they, that's not the concern. So um, yes, it would be nice to have all kinds of things like this, but the planning department can't provide it. Um, I can't provide it. Um, what I'm asking the planning board to consider is whether they think this is, makes sense in the big picture and given appropriate protections, which I think are here, um, the zoning really carries very, really no risk at all, um, but then allows and encourages private part entities to spend the time and money to come forward then. And then all the questions you ask and tack and all the rest of it comes into play. And it could be, as it sometimes is, you go through all of this, you spend all your money, you do it right, and it, it just doesn't work. And if that happens, that's what happens. But at this stage, to demand all that would basically mean that it stays what it is. It stays as a, a, a kind of a dilapidated and poorly lit uh, parking uh, uh, space, parking uh, lot, and uh, we'll shell out another 300,000 in, in a year or two to, to patch it up. And in 20 years, we'll do it again, and so on and so forth. So, so that's but, but my- Janet, I'm gonna give you a pause, Janet, just, but I just, I wanna make sure we don't put the cart in front of the horse. We're really just talking about zoning change. And as George related, there's so much more that has to happen for, think, for this, think, for this, not, for this concept. So I would like to uh, see if anybody else wants to speak uh, on the planning board. And then Janet, you can, uh, I would like you to come in after that, but I uh, just want to make sure that we get everybody uh, opinion, uh, Doug. Yeah, I guess um, I think I, I'm not sure I agree with George about the fact that the town couldn't do some of the work that is needed to develop a vision for this area. Um, and so I guess my question for George and, and uh, Evan is, why did you put this forward as a straight zoning change as opposed to a motion that directs the town manager to have planning staff spend some time of their own, you know, of the, the staff we're already paying, uh, just put this, this concept on, on a higher priority in terms of their task list so that, you know, we might have some conceptual ideas for what you would do before we talk about the rezoning. And I think the, the biggest difficulty I have is that this it just seems like a very odd way to have this show up with us uh, without, you know, first of all, you're, up, you're, you're here by yourself. You know, where's the bid? Um, you know, have you built consensus for this? Um, you know, and um, right. so, you know, it just, it's, it's just weird. And it, so it, it, we're accustomed to having the planning staff kind of come to us with some work done for consideration and comment, and and you're you're kind of out here coming in from left field, and uh, so it's just a little bit kind of hard to wrap your head around. George, you want to respond? Yeah, no, I, I hear that, and maybe that will be the decision of the planning board. They simply want uh, more information, and uh, I can't give it to you right now, and I can't speak for the planning department. I think that. Um, the approach is, is obviously different than what you're used to. Um, it's driven largely by um, the, the business community, and I apologize they're not here. Uh, the bid executive director was here, um, but she's just gone. So um, she could speak uh, much more uh, eloquently and forcefully than I can about uh, the business community interest. But um, yeah, I think that uh, the planning department is already up to their eyeballs in, in, in work and projects. And I think the feeling of Evan and myself was this is something that um, we knew there was interest in the private sector to do this before COVID. And our understanding is there still is interest, but no one's gonna touch it if the zoning stays RG. So if the planning board is willing to do something a little bit different and take that um, I consider really minimal risk. That kind of work will be done, not by our planning staff, that yes, we do pay, 
um, and uh, but probably not enough, but we do pay them. And uh, they work very hard and they are, as you know, uh, they're obviously up to their, right? So um, it, it would basically go on the back burner. Um, and Paul has got 5,000 things to do. It would go on the back burner. And I think if that's what the planning board is comfortable with, then that's what will happen. Then it will go on the back burner and it will stay what it is um, probably for a very, very long time. Um, so I also hear that I would like to have uh, the bid executive director here. I'd like to have a few more <laughs> members from the business community here, um, but uh, tonight they're not here. So I can't, I can't uh, answer that. But uh, yes, the approach is probably not what is usual. And uh, we're asking you to consider it and think about it in terms of, of the, the broader vision of what's happening at Amherst and, and is going to be happening. Um, but in the end we will do obviously, well, we will follow your guidance. Great. Th thank you, Doug. Good comments, uh, George. Thank you for the response, uh, Janet. So, so I appreciate I appreciate the pitch, and I, I I'm not against the idea. What I'm hoping for is some information that we regularly get, um, which is just some sketches of the different, you know, like the comparison between the three lots. It's not super expensive. It's not super hard to do, but somebody has to do it. And I do agree that the planning department is beyond stretched out. So when I read your um, you know, supplemental thing, it said that there is a preliminary analysis by a potential bidder working with an architect with experience in parking garages and did show that the space could support a parking garage if 100% coverage was allowed. And if you look at the 1990 report, they do a super extensive drawings for this lot, including the CVS lot, but they also just did Sort of, I don't know, I'm not using the right word, but they just, they looked at the other two lots and they drew around them. And I don't think it's particularly expensive, but it's very, very useful to see what can be done. And I would love to see even just a basic schematic of what can be done. We, I mean, obviously someone has already done it and did they get the setback? So what's the consequence of the zoning of BG? And so I would love to get that information, which is the information we normally do before we make a recommendation to rezone something, which is obviously a very big deal. The other thing is, is there is some deal, there are some bidders, um, the bid is interested. So I would love to have them come here and make the proposals and saying, this is our vision. Here's some drawings. Here's why we picked this. Here's what's possible. It's interesting to me that the Bank of America lot sits, you know, it's, it's a big lot. They only use it during banking hours and they given permission for um, Amherst Cinema people to use at night. You know, it seems very possible to me that that would be a, a site for a parking garage combined with the town lot. And I think, you know, you're you're making a propo very specific proposal, and we're a planning board, and we sort of sit back more, and collect information, and sort of are looking at the bigger picture. And so that would help me to see the bigger picture and know more some more detail. Um, I understand your urgency, but I, I think you're looking for a recommendation, and and we. We, we, I need more information before going forward. Um, I did, so that's one thing. And so I don't, I don't think what I'm asking for is very expensive. It's what we normally see. Um, if there's a bidder and an architect, they'll understand that they could provide that pretty quickly, um, especially if they have experience with garages too. Um, the, other, the other thing, um, but I would like to go to the TAC and get their input or even have someone from the TAC invited to look at this. Um, the other issue I see is, um, you know, going over three stories. And I think I, I sent an email to Chris is that I think that in the use table, one idea is to say that, you know, to, to, to add a sentence to the use table, basically in saying that no public or par private parking garage shall exceed three stories or 35 feet in any zoning district, no waivers or exceptions shall be allowed. And that would just put the kibosh on you know, going over, you know, two, three stories for the parking garage, it doesn't put the kibosh on five, 10 years down the road. Maybe the lot isn't turned into a parking garage. The town would like some money. It has a valuable lot now zone BG, and then they could sell it for, you know, whatever, you know, five stories, something. And I think that's a great concern of the neighbors. And, you know, there's no, how do you, you know, that concern I think has to be addressed and not by saying it's not going to be in the RFP, but once the zoning is there, it's there. And it can be, you know, the town could say, let's sell a lot for something, you know, building, it might be, you know, some of the lots in town are worth millions of dollars now. 
And suddenly this is a very valuable asset and people on North Prospect Street are gonna be looking at a five story something. And so I don't think it's, I think we have to look at the long-term consequences too and, and discuss those also. Thank you, Janet. Um, without any other hands on the planning board, let's open it up to public. And I see two hands raised, Pam, oh, excuse me, Harry Peltz, mm -hmm. and then Pam Rooney. Oh, there's a third, uh, 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 Ronnie Parker. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm saying that correctly. And then Jennifer Taub, Kathy Shane, and then uh, Dorothy Pam. So we have, well, and then Susanna Musprat. So we, we have uh, over half a dozen. Um, and uh, I will watch the, the three minute timer here. I'm getting set up here, but please, Harry, uh, you will be first, you know, say you're, you're oh, you, you've got to go in there. Uh, I Pam. did, thank you. I yes, got thank it. You. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, first be Harry, you know, just state your name and address and uh, you have three minutes. Harry is muted. Yep. Harry, can oh. you unmute? I, I see a new button. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank All you. Right. My name's Harry Peltz. I live at 32 North Prospect Street in Amherst. And I attended a community uh, commission meeting a few weeks ago when this was adjourned. This, this particular meeting uh, tonight was adjourned at that time, the planning board told me. And there were a number of people there. And it seems to me the, the, the card is being put before the horse. And we don't know what the horse is going to be once it comes in. But let me be use my three minutes productively. I believe that uh, Mr. Ryan indicated there would be a, uh, not that many more spaces created by uh, this endeavor. But I would like to point out that if you look at the maps, the only access to this lot is off of North Prospect Street. And as Ms. McGowan indicated, the neighbors and the people, and there were about 10 or 12 of us who were present at the commission meeting a few weeks ago are very concerned about that. North Prospect Street is immediately to the west of this. It is the only access to that lot from any direction. It is a two lane road. One lane is dedicated during the UMass school year to residents who live on that street. And it uh, is a one-way street headed southbound from, and has to be entered from uh, the north to, to come down. How you're going to get access to any structure there is going to be very, very difficult. Create a traffic problem that is going to be enormous. And immediately to the west on the other side of the street where I live along with uh, my neighbors is a historic district, a designated historic district. And it's not going to uh, do anything for the property values or for the uh, ambiance in that area. You indicated that this uh, project may not be profitable and it will break even because only uh, if it breaks even, then it benefits the town. But what private entrepreneur is going to want to invest money in building a parking lot that only breaks even? And how do we, uh, we even have that there? The commission that I was before kept saying, oh, we're not going to have a parking lot. That we're just going to do this to, to explore things. Uh, I just cannot tell you. I made a uh, um, highway department request for them to uh, look into the dangerous condition of exiting driveways on North Prospect Street now, headed southbound out of the residences. When the traffic coming from UMass comes down there at excessive speeds and the view is blocked headed northbound of making some accommodation. That request was made nearly six months ago, and I have yet to get a report which was supposedly being written three months ago. I believe this is a very poorly conceived way to uh, approach things. You have studies from 1990 
it's time for more studies. I have been here for a number of years, only residing physically here, but I've been in this area. And that lot is not used that much at all. And if you can go by on almost any day, and I know recently uh, only a few seven cars or so are there, maybe because of COVID, but it has never been an overused lot. You can see the percentages that Mr. Ryan presented in his uh, presentation, which were very, very, and I'm sorry, my time is out, but I am very, very yeah. opposed to this. I believe my fellow uh, neighbors are. Here, you know, Harry, you, you can ask for more time, um, but but you you <laughs> you're, you're over three minutes. But if do you want another minute, or are you good? Yep. He's good. Okay. Okay. So um, so we'll go on to Pam. Pam Rooney, is that your uh, Name and address, thank you. Hi, Pam Rooney. I do appreciate being allowed to speak. I, I hope that at some point uh, the board will actually listen to the folks that show up and speak about concerns. We really just want a healthy, vibrant and, and exciting town center. All of this is said in that light. I heard a couple things that I strongly agree with, and that is let's plan first and then let's zone. Let's not put the cart before the horse and change a zoning uh, in the hopes that maybe something can work uh, in the future. I think if a, the, the, the request for diagrams for all of the different parking areas should be part of this conversation before the planning board takes a vote to recommend this, this uh, zoning change. Zoning changes are a big deal. And I think you all have a very strong responsibility for having the facts in front of you before you just, I will say cavalierly rezone something. Let's get some diagrams. Let's see what the capacities of the different sites are. People can do this. I see three planning, uh, three uh, architects on the planning board, and they themselves could do some simple diagrams. The planning staff we know is absolutely maxed out and is trying very hard to push things through the system. So let's see some diagrams. Let's see if it makes sense. There are a number of unanswered questions, even though this is supposedly just to rezone, we all know that the intent to rezone is to uh, encourage construction development behind CVS. Um, who would own the garage? Who, who would reap the benefits of it? Would the town have to purchase, for instance, uh, the easement or the access way between CVS and the Miss Saigon building? Um, and, and also, I, I don't fully believe that once the site is rezoned to BG that there could be any restriction in place on the height of a building because in fact, the dimensional table would allow for more than three stories. So I disagree that, that oh, we can deal with that later. So I think the planning board has a really big responsibility in front of them to have the facts in order before you recommend a rezoning change. BG is definitely not even the right zone. Uh, the, the BG district backs up, uh, would back up immediately against a, an RG neighborhood. And in fact, it's really imperative that there be a buffer. So before you do anything, look at the facts, compare the, the options, compare the zoning uh, district, the various zoning districts that might apply. Don't just, don't just Please move ahead and and push through something that isn't completely thought through. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Uh, so next we have uh, is it, I, I I hope I pronounce this uh, correctly. Ronnie Parker. Yes, this is Ronnie Parker. Okay, state your name and address. 
Yeah. Sunny Parker, new to the neighborhood, soon to be a resident of 24 North Prospect. Um, I'm so grateful to my neighbors who've spoken because a lot of what I feel has been expressed. But I will, and I've written to Mr. Ryan, not realizing he was the advocate for this, um, arguing for all the reasons why it shouldn't happen. Um, in any event, uh, I'd like to address his question of his um, focus on how this is really about Amherst of the future, because it is about Amherst of the future. Is Amherst of the future going to be bringing in or trying desperately to bring in hundreds more cars? What are we going to do about making it a sustainable place with more trees, more bicycle traffic, and of course, access to cars? Nobody's saying no. Are there any EV charges on these proposed parking lots. Um, I feel like if we're going to go this route, we really need to think about the future in a more comprehensive way. And I would say to Mr. Ryan that it's not a this or nothing. You know, sit down and consult with us. And I think you'll find that there are lots of options, not just the technical options that others have alluded to that the planning people will come up with, but there's a lot of opportunity for vision among the people who live there. So I think there are other options. So we're really rushing into this. I would urge the planning board not to, to put off whatever decision you're going to make about this uh, for that reason. Um, I also, I'm a business owner, so I'm not opposed to economic development, but let's not fool ourselves about business. Business, private sector does not get into things where they don't make money. That's, I mean, no private sector is going to step in and do things for Amherst's good alone. Um, and then I had one other comment, and this has to do with the condition of the road. Um, since I do also work in um, industry where construction happens, I can tell you that if the Department of um, the Transportation Office in Massachusetts probably will not allow that road to be used in the ways we're talking about, even for construction vehicles that are projected to be there as a site for the building uh, of the library. It is a tiny road. It is a weak, weak road. It doesn't have the structure underneath to support the kinds of traffic we're talking about. So I think that we do need a lot more research uh, to undertake this. And thank you for letting me speak. And I really look forward to meeting these neighbors who have spoken up today in person. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, so we have Jennifer and then uh, Kathy and then Dorothy and Susanna. So uh, uh, Jennifer, Todd, please uh, state your name and address. Um, yes, my name is Jennifer Taub at 259 Lincoln Avenue. And I actually wrote something because I wanted to be sure I got it into the three minutes. Oops. So um, when the town established zoning, it determined that there would be at least a certain number of feeder blocks, which would serve as a buffer between the general business district and the general residence neighborhoods. And that buffer is the business limited district. So it would be one thing to rezone the town's portion of the parking lot behind CBS from its current RG designation to business limited but to skip over the BL altogether and rezone to BG denies North Prospect Street as well as some other streets that feed into it. It just denies them any buffer between it and the business general dist district. Um, and among the protections that the BL designation provides to the adjacent residential neighborhoods is that the buildings in the BL will not exceed three stories while in the BG they could be five stories. And again, from the beginning of zoning, it seems up until this moment or maybe it was just four to six weeks ago we even heard that there was even an idea that this rezoning would happen or was it even being thought of happening. Um, the town planners had agreed that five-story buildings were really not appropriate next door, you know, to single family and multi-unit dwellings, which is what's in the adjacent uh, RG neighborhood. Um, and I, I kind of feel confident that none of the planning board members would also, you know, appreciate a five-story building going up across the street from them or, or next door. And the rush to rezone the CVS lot from RG to BG seems especially confounding, like others have said before me, since it's not at all clear that it's even feasible to build a parking structure and the location being discussed. Yet once the town's parcels behind CVS are rezoned from RG to BG, the universe of what can be built 
on the east side of North Pleasant vastly increases. And I, I could live with a, you know, if there was some sort of, could be a guarantee of that anything built there wouldn't be more than three stories and that it would be, you know, sort of screened with trees. But I, for what I'm hearing tonight is when the chair says that we're just talking about rezoning, that there couldn't be any sort of, what do they call it, contract zoning or any kind of rider attached, it would just be rezoned to BG, that there couldn't be anything specified that it would only be a three-story parking structure. So, you know, again, as people have said, I can just imagine two or three or more years down the road when it's the parcel's been rezoned to, to BG and then there, you know, it may turn out a parking structure is not feasible there for all the other reasons that others have discussed. So that there's an application for a five-story apartment building or office building in that location. And if the residents say, well, in 2021, you know, our councilman promised us that that structure would never be built there. I can't imagine that that argument would really get us very far with the future planning board. So I echo what's already been offered in public comments of, you know, please don't skip over BL and, and rezone from RG to BG. And of course I would ask if, you know, rezoning not be done before the feasibility study has happened to determine if the purpose for which you'd rezone, be rezoning, supposedly the parking structure is even doable in that location. And I still don't understand why there couldn't be a feasibility study before the rezoning. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Kathy and then uh, Dorothy and then Susanna. So Kathy, Shane, uh, state your name and address again. Hi, I'm Kathy Shane. I live at 519 Montague Road, and um, I'm speaking as a resident. For those of you who do or don't know Montague Road, that's Route 63 going north, and we're almost at the north end. So we frequently drive downtown um, and experience the various lots. So I, I actually wrote up comments and sent them. I sent them to you, Chris, but I didn't get them be before this meeting, so you can have other other comments that I did in writing. And I just wanted to make some points that haven't been already made. Um, in addition to the question of why BG, why not BL? We could think of why not BN, because BN at least allows you some di dimensional waivers. So some of the issues are, are lot coverage, um, but something that's a buffer zone. I worry that this looks like spot zoning to me um, you either are planning to do the whole street this way. Spot zoning is not legal in Massachusetts, where you just pick a little piece out. So the lot next to it is still uh, zoned the way it's zoned. And this little, so the CVS lot, so we're cascading along all of it. So I think we should avoid doing something that's illegal. This is a loss of 70 spaces. George talked about an addition. Um, yes, we might need to do repair. It sounds like we'll need to do repair of the roads. Uh, we don't have any linkage fees for developers. These are legal. And I gave you a citation of some towns that do it. When a development goes up, they contribute to a parking fund, for example, to help build a garage. And we could put those on the books. And I just, um, the whole issue of scale is a real one that people have already asked about, but getting some sense of what, what could you build on two thirds of an acre? When the 1990 study was done, they were assuming an acre and they came up with 240 spaces. So I'm not really sure you could get 190 out of it. And they were going a, a, an underground layer and then a rooftop layer. So staying within, they weren't rezoning for that lot, by the way, they were designing it. And just so people don't get excited about the idea of the Northampton lot, that's 400 spaces. It's really big. So just to be able to think about it, the access to this is horrible now. And that's one of the reasons it's less used. The signage is really bad. You don't even know there's a lot back there, but you go through that tiny era alleyway if you're coming in the middle of town or you have to know to go way up north and and come back in it's hard to get to it's hard to leave so the preferred lot is the north commons parking lot they're full all the time and you can look at i can send you the revenues that's the big money winner it's just hard to get to so i think that's all i want to say now but the one other concern i have um when publicly there have been some statements and i think it was the bid 
who made this that one of the developers' interests is potential long-term lease to the tenants. We might not have very many public spaces if we give away this land. Um, the underground garage is already long-term lease. So you might, we might really lose control. So I think some design concerns, do we really have public spaces? What's the price to park there if we no longer control it are big ones? And I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Dorothy and then uh, Susanna. Dorothy, state your name and address. Hi, Dorothy Pam, 229 Amity Street. And again, I'm speaking as a private person, not as a town councilor. Um, I do agree with uh, George and Evan on the question of certainty of being able to park. Um, and that's why the idea of a garage has some attraction. But um, I think that uh, there've been so many good comments made both by planning board members and the public as to the various problems with this particular lot. I don't think this is the place to do it. Uh, I am definitely in favor of having um, a detailed study of the Boltwood lot and the Amity lot uh, as uh, combining the Bank of America with the town lot. Um, what's wrong with this particular spot is it is um, not visible. Uh, the access is very difficult um, and um, it, it just it just won't work. I mean, the idea of certainty of parking means you know where the garage is, you know how to get there, you can get in and you can get out, and that there would be spaces, always be some spaces available for people. So that the whole long-term parking thing is not really a good idea. So I, um, I second some of the ideas that uh, George brought up, uh, but I do not think that the North Prospect lot, now that I have had a chance to learn more about the size and what could be built there and, um, have thought about the access more. I don't think this will be the place that will give us the certainty, the assurance, yes, I'll be able to find a place to park. So I, I do hope that you will set some kind of study going to look at other areas for this. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, uh, Susanna, state your name and address. Uh, Chris, do you want to speak now? Oh. Chris is on mute. I just, I said Susanna just unmuted herself, so I think she'll be able to speak now, and then I would like to speak after that. Very good. Thank you. Susanna, um, you'll say uh, your name and address. Susanna Muspret, 38 North Prospect Street. I uh, wrote to you on July 2nd with many concerns about this proposal to rezone for a parking garage. And it was in your packet for the July 7th meeting. I really hope you will reread my um, memo before you make your recommendation. I don't wanna take up time tonight by repeating my concerns. But as planners, certainly you understand the importance of careful planning before any zoning changes are promulgated. So I would second what other speakers have said about the importance of doing that kind of analysis, comparing all the various lots. Um, I, I have a point of clarification I'd like. When, George, when you talk about uh, three levels of parking, and Evan's memo mentions the top level is a, an open air parking deck. Is that a fourth level of parking or a third level? That's a fourth, third. Well, then the math just doesn't add up. I don't think, I don't think you can get um, that many spaces on each level. Um, but I also feel that it's really important for the people in the town to know more about how this garage would be operated before, um, before this all takes place because we have rights under the charter to try to oppose things if we understand what they are, but we can't do that by just going to the ZBA at the end. And I don't think that the traffic analysis should wait until after 
the uh, potential partner has gone to all the trouble and expense of designing the garage and whatever. The traffic analysis is, is something that should be done at the beginning before you decide you want to do this. And it is really a problem on our street. If you end up having to take away all the street parking on Coles Lane and North Prospect to make this garage work, you're not going to gain very much in the way of spaces. So that has to happen first. I don't think that's really the, the work of the private partner, but if it is, it still needs to happen before this rezoning is, is undertaken. Um, I think we need to understand how the revenue would be apportioned. Is it all going to go to the private partner? We definitely want to understand whether this garage is for short-term short parking for visitors to town, as your memo kind of implies, or whether this is really just a way of providing long-term reserve parking for the inhabitants of the big buildings downtown who aren't having to pay to put in parking in their buildings. And I just don't think that it's legal to take taxpayer money, taxpayer land bought with taxpayer money and give it away to a private entity for little or no revenue so that they can take the revenue from the garage and at the same time, give another boon to the developers. I'm sick and tired of this and it just isn't right. If you're an honest government, you need to be square with the citizens about what the intent is of this garage. And if you want us to trust government, you, the planning board, need to not move forward with this until we get some answers. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, Chris? I just wanted to clarify something, and I think Rob and I both spoke to this at the July 7th meeting, um, that um, this is not a case of um, spot zoning. Um, it's an extension of an existing zoning district, and Rob actually had a word for it, which doesn't come to mind right now to me, but it is um, legal, and perhaps you'd like Rob to say a few words about this. Rob? Yeah, I'll just add, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of um, case law on this, and it's considered a boundary parcel uh, because it's right up against the BG district. So it's not isolated in any way. So there are the majority of the cases. In fact, there's very, very few that uh, have been overturned, but almost all the cases uh, would find that this is not an example of spot zoning. Uh, and there's different criteria that's used when, when assessing that as well, including whether or not it serves a public good. Uh, but I think it's our opinion at this point that it would not uh, not constitute a, an example of spot zoning. Okay, so no spot zoning. All right. Um, so I think that's what we have from uh, the public. And we can open it up again to um, the board. Um, Janet. And then Doug. I was, I was wondering if A, we could take a break. And then I realized I was looking at my notes and that Doug and I um, met with Christine for a site visit. And so there were some questions and answers from that. I just realized from looking at that, so. Did I skip over that? I'm sorry. Um, do, I, do you want to speak to that or, or Doug? But I kind of wanted, I wanted to know if we could take a break also. I have a. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of wanted to. <laughs> Speak to that as well, because I, I, I didn't think we'd be going long tonight. And uh, so we just, not Tom Long, but um, <laughs> I thought we would uh, not have, you know, 1130 or whatever. So I apologize for that. And and if uh, we, we certainly could take a break um, because it's back in our court. So good idea, Janet. Uh, so let's take a, like a five minute recess. Uh, just take your video off and 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 you know, mute and uh, we'll get back at around uh, 9.05.
Um, got everybody back. I yeah, one, two, three, four, five of us. Uh, I got a, t a text from um, from Maria. She's she's in the car coming back from New York. <laughs> But obviously, she won't be joining us. But um, so we want to get us back engaged here, Pam. Okay, you're good, Jack. All righty. At nine oh five. Okay, so I think we're back to uh, you know we're you know, public comment. Uh, I think we need you know additional discussion from the planning board and, uh, you know, looking for, for any input, input from, uh, you know, the five of us that are here. So, uh, Johanna and then, oh, Chris first and then Johanna and then Doug. So I just wanted to note that I got in touch with our town attorney, um, Joel Bard about the voting quantum that's required for a recommendation from the planning board. And even though this is a zoning amendment that you're voting on, um, the recommendation only takes a majority of those present and voting rather than a two thirds majority as it does for the town council to vote. So I thought you might wanna know that. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. So we have Johanna, uh, Doug, and then Tom. Johanna? Great. Well, I will say I feel a little bit like we're stuck in a chicken and egg scenario um, where people are thirsty for more information, but from what George and what others have said, we can't really get that information until we open the door to this idea because then, you know, a developer who actually has viable skin in the game will put in the energy and the work to do it. And so one of the things that I keep coming back to is the finances of this all and what that means for the town and for taxpayers. So it seems like if we don't open the door to this, you know, kind of other use, we are stuck with the parking lot basically as it is, and it's already dilapidated and it's going to cost the town roughly $300,000, if not more, because costs likely have gone up to make it usable for its current use. And then, you know, and like, is that the best use? I, you know, I don't know, I don't really know, but um, you know, my guess is probably not. Like if we want, if there's, if people feel there's a strong need for parking, you know, we could maximize, this would be a site where we maximize it. And it seems like Boltwood isn't as good and Amity Street is an option, but it's too small and then it would, costs like $265,000 roughly took if they were going to acquire the Bank of America lot. So just like I recognize the chicken and egg nature of it, but just from a pure financial standpoint, my thinking right now is open up this opportunity to explore this so that we can get the information that we need, whether that's the parking study or the design schematics and kind of all the stuff that we want. Um, and then I don't quite know what to do about the three-story versus five-story stuff and how to make people feel like there are assurances on that. So those are my thoughts. Good ones. Thank you, Johanna. Um, Doug, and then Tom, and then Janet. Yeah, I guess, um, I, I mean, I, several things that I heard in the public comments uh you know i do have comments about i uh you know there was comment that this site is not particularly visible and i think of the northampton garage behind thorns which you could drive around in on the main streets of northampton for a while and never know it was there so i'm not sure i buy that argument um, and then the folks who are saying, you know, nobody's going to build a parking garage that is only going to break even. Uh, I don't buy that either because the pe people that are going to build this garage would be people that own other property in town and want to make their other property more valuable. So 
um, you know, they may break even on the garage, but they're going to have a benefit from having a more attractive downtown for people to park in and or, or shop or live or whatever. Um, I'm, I'm really torn um, about this. You know, I don't want to vote against it, but I'm not really feeling particularly enthused about voting for it. Um, you know, the people that want more, more uh, information and floor plans, sure, I could go ahead and draw you a parking garage on that site. And the, the plan that I drew would look pretty much like the parking lot that's right there right now. So, you know, it's going to be two tiers of 60 feet with a parking uh, spot on each side and a 20 foot travel lane in the middle. And it's going to be buried one story into grade uh, because of the slope of the site. And um, yeah, you know, you could either access it through the existing alley or off of North Pleasant Street. So I'm not sure it's really worth anybody's time to make a drawing for this hearing and, and what we're about right now. Um, you know, if folks want to uh, continue the hearing again, I'm not sure there's any particular deadline that we need to do this by. You know, we could continue it until November, just just to just for the heck of it. Just we we didn't kill it, but we didn't do anything with it. And um, you know, in the meantime, town council could could change and become more enthused, or maybe the planning board would have time or the planning staff would have time to work on it. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, you know, right now I, I'm, I'm almost an abstain vote. Um, but I'm, I would like to hear from Tom and uh, anybody else who hasn't spoken much. Very good, Doug. I mean, I, 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 I um, express your sentiments there. Um, so we have Janet and Tom. So um, everything happens in context. And so right now we have like 18 or 19 zoning amendments kind of in the hopper. I've lost kind of track. And so, um, and you know, one of our jobs is to do analyze and review them and make recommendations. And, and I'm wondering like, what an intermediate step could be. Because right now I couldn't vote to recommend this spot, this rezoning. I couldn't vote, I'm not gonna vote against, you know, a parking garage on this spot. I just don't know enough stuff. So I'm sorry, I have like a whining dog in the background, but so. Um, <laughs> I was wondering that was in my- uh, That could be house. just our emotional, <laughs> could be our emotional state after five weeks of meetings. But anyway, so Daisy is expressing something. But anyway, um, so I'm wondering, I'm looking for like an intermediate step that doesn't shut the door on this idea for two years, because that doesn't seem right either. Um, so I, I wondered, you know, like if, if we, you know, say we recommend not to or whatever, or the town council votes against it, that kind of dooms the idea for two years unless the planning board wants to bring it back. I do think we need more information. I don't think it's super extensive or super expensive. Um, I do, I do worry about these 20 foot setbacks. I do think I'd like to see more stuff. I'm wondering if the proponents, of the counselors that propose this could withdraw this zoning amendment and then st like request what I think Doug was saying earlier, ask the town manager to start a process of analysis um, and not just put that on the planning department. Um, you know, I'm sure people on the planning board would be happy to I, you know, do a little task force or something or, but also the bid you know, has skin in the game and they have resources. There's a bidder or some people who have an architect who already done some drawings. And I just wondered if the intermediate move would be just to withdraw this zoning amendment and start kind of a more usual process to consider this. And so I, I don't have, you know, I just need more information and I don't wanna kill it. And I don't see myself going forward with this without more information. You know, even, even questions we had at the site visit was, you know, how does the town have, you know, is, do we have like a egress from North Pleasant Street? Do we have an easement to allowing, you know, people to come in to use the lot or on North 
you know, on North Prospect, like we, you know, kind of what's there, why is CVS have its parking spaces on town land, you know, but, but I, I do think um, it will just give some breathing space and some time and we need some breathing space right now we're doing too much and I don't want to give something short shrift but I, I feel like this is just not enough stuff so I wondered if people would think about an intermediate step and we could continue it and talk about it in another month or so or and hopefully get that information or you know kind of put it into the usual process for a little more um so that that's my idea just if it's withdrawn and comes back in in the more usual way of a little more analysis and building on past work. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, Tom? Sure, so as of now, I can't vote on this, but I did, I mean, I've been listening and I have some really interesting sort of reactions and I, I like the way um, Johanna framed it and it was similar to my thoughts. I also think that both Janet and Doug are sharing a similar kind of feeling in the sense of not knowing where we are. And, and I'm as of listening to just this hearing, I wasn't at the last one, but um, I'm not entirely sure what we're, what the risk is, right? And I think George had mentioned it's a low risk proposition to just rezone this with conditions. And if we do so, what are we risking by inviting that? And I think that's what I want to know most of all before we go forward. Like, I'm not worried about what comes after because we'll get to look at that again and have to approve that before it gets built right or before it goes to the next steps um, as part of the planning process but i'm i'm interested in what people's perceived because i've been reading and or listening to all the comments from the, the the public as well as the planning board and i'm i'm trying to get a feel for what those risks are um, so I think that would help me better understand what's going on and maybe the public better understand how we get, Janet, as you're saying, from here to the next step, right? The, what, what do we need to know in order to make this? So what are the risks we were taking by opening this up to, uh, you know, an outside firm to come in and, and make a proposal? So, and I, right. I don't feel like I know that answer yet, um, but maybe other people you know, have jotted down a list or I didn't, I just didn't hear enough of them. Yeah. So um, I, Chris, you know, you've heard from, I think all of us, and I don't know if, you know, you or George or Rob uh, want to follow up, but you know, there, there definitely are some, you know, concerns, um, you know, process related timing, you know, planning versus zoning sort of things. So uh, I will call on Chris first and then George. So one thing people used to do during town meeting time was to um, recommend referral back to the planning board for further study. So that's one option that you could recommend to town council that this would be referred back to the planning board and that you would ask town council to um, ask the town manager to direct the planning department to work on this. I mean, that's, that's a possibility. Um, but sending it back to the planning board and the planning board department for further study is one option. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, uh, George, and then I think I saw Doug's hand up. So George and then Doug. George, you're on mute. Thank you, sorry. Um, I'm going to suggest, uh, I hear that the question of risk needs to be clarified. Um, and I feel very strongly that we need to hear from the bid. And I'm, well, I'm discouraged a little bit tonight that, that there were not members here uh, from the business community speaking. So I think you really need to hear from them. And if you don't hear from them, then that raises red flags in my own mind, quite frankly. Um, so I would suggest, rather than referral to the um, to the planning department um, and have them work on it, or to the town manager, both of whom are extraordinarily busy, um, that that if you're willing to do this in a month, I mean, again, there's no rush here, but within a month or two, whenever given your schedule, which is I know is difficult, but we come back, address the question of, I mean, and there may be some other questions you want that that you'll note, but address the question of risk and um, have, hear from the business community. Um, we're hearing from the residents appropriately, but we need to hear from 
the restaurant owners, the shop owners, from members of the bid, um, just about why they want this, because that's what's driving it for me. Um, I think it's important for the future of our downtown. I think it's important for the future of, of what's coming. But as you can see tonight, I'm one voice. And so I think the other thing that I would expect at this, if we did a continuance, is that there would be voices from the business community that would show up and, and tell us what they think. I would like to hear from them myself, actually. Um, and if there are other things, um, I can tell you this, they're, they're not going to be studies of other sites. The interest is in this site. Um, and if you are, if you share with me the sense that this has some legs and is worth looking at, then let's look at it. But uh, I'm, I, you're not going to get somebody looking at Boltwood or somebody looking at, uh, you know, um, Amity and, and giving you options. That's not what's going on here. So um, if you are open to that, looking at this site, um, getting a clear sense of what the risks are, um, and putting the burden on really on the on us, the presenters, not on the planning staff, not on not on the town manager um, and continue it for say a month or whenever in the next month or two. Um, that's what I would suggest. Yeah, I, I feel like we're having a, a hard time uh, unhitching the zoning change from the you know, ultimate you know, proposal here, which is, which is again, um, you know, everything's above board here. You know, this, you know, full disclosure, that sort of thing. And Jack, uh, it's, it's, is, yeah. it's, it's hard. I'm, yeah. I'm not suggesting that we're going to present a, a, a set of drawings or a plan. Right. Oh, I understand. But I just, so, but we're, it, we're locked into yeah. what this is all about. And so it's very challenging, I think, for us. So, uh, so we have Doug and Janet. Yeah, I, I simply raised my hand because I was not sure. Did Chris, Chris, did you mean to say that we could? recommend that this be referred back to us as a planning board or did you mean to say the planning staff i meant to say not that it would be referred back because it didn't come to from the planning board to begin with but that it be referred to the planning board and the planning staff for further study okay thank you thank you um janet so I was I, I would add to that. Um, I don't know if the TAC has time to do it, but I know there's people in the TAC who are transportation people. It would, it would be helpful to get them to come in and talk to us also. And then I was interested in the idea of the BN zoning. Um, I just hadn't really thought that through. I knew there were other zoning options and that would give you flexibility about lot coverage and then um, limit to three stories and oh, you know, that providing that buffer to the RG that that we do. Um, so I, I think that's it. Um, the other thing is, is that when we I talk about a diagram, I don't, I'm not talking about something super extensive. In fact, a lot of it is in that 1990 report, which would have to be updated and maybe stuff. I don't think it's super complicated. So that would maybe, you know, if we refer it back to us, there's time to do that. And then if we continue the hearing, um, there's time to do that. I would say a little bit more than four weeks, because I think that time will go fast in terms of what we're working on now. So maybe a little bit more. I'm open to both. Yeah, so does, um, I, I mean, I, I, I'm wondering if anyone's uh, to move, you know, that we continue this hearing uh, to, you know, a date in September. That's agreeable to all of us, but I see, you know, Chris and then Doug's uh, hands are up. So Chris. I just wanted to let you know when the dates in September were. Um, there's one date, which is September 1st, and you will be hearing a, a presentation about an Amherst College wayfinding sign project on that night. And um, we don't really have anything else. We have a minor thing for the Survival Center. So September 1st is a possibility, and September 29th is a possibility. There are no dates in the middle of September thus far because of um, religious holidays. So, you know, I, it, it just seems like we need a little bit more, um, you know, work done to, I think, to satisfy some of the concerns that I've heard. So I'm wondering if the September 1st is, is uh, too soon. But uh, Doug, your thoughts? Uh, I'd like to move that we continue this hearing until September 29th. Okay. 
I will second that. Yes. Uh, any discussion amongst the board? I see none. Okay, roll call. Um, uh, Doug? Aye. Uh, Tom? Aye. Janet? Aye. Uh, Johanna? Aye. And I am an aye as well. So that's five zero for a continuance of the hearing to uh, September 29th. I think we should state a uh, time also. So mm -hmm. let's say um, seven o'clock on September 29th. The Amherst College project will probably take longer than a half hour, but if you say seven o'clock, then um, people who are interested can arrive at that time. Chris, okay. Amherst, Amherst College is on September 1st. The motion I'm sorry. Is oh yeah. So we have, um, so we may have another project that night, but so you, why don't you say 635 on September 29th? All right. 635. 635, September 29th. Thank you. Very good. Um, and George, any closing? Oh, you have your hand up. Yeah. Not so much closing remarks, except thank you to all of you. Um, it's taken longer, I know, than we'd hoped, but um, I think this has been very fruitful. It's been very helpful to me. Um, hearing from all of you, and, and so I appreciate that. Just want to be clear, you are expecting, I believe, a presentation from us on the 29th that would address, I have five items here that you would like us to address, um, the risks, uh, what they are exactly, if, if you just rezone, what would the, the risks be to the town. Um, I would expect a presentation from the bid or from the business community, maybe a number of people, but at least someone speaking to that. Um, request the TAC look at this um, and provide some sort of input um, and that we look at the BN zoning option and that um, that's what I have. Now, am I missing anything? Well, I, I, I guess they're looking at like a maybe a conceptual site plan. Again, you're just looking at a zoning change, but I guess, you know, seeing, seeing this thing, um, again, it's really hard to unlink the zoning change from what the intended purpose is down the work and down the line but so yeah, i guess um, i'm asking yeah do, what, what do you as a group what do you want from us do you want some kind of conceptual plan um uh is that fair to ask chris well if the bid is involved the bid has some members who are architects and if they think this is a good idea they may be willing to do that I can ask okay. them and, and urge them to consider that, but I guess I, can't, I certainly can't promise it, certainly mm -hmm. not tonight, but um, I would ask in, in their presentation that they would they would consider that. So we have Doug and then Janet. Doug? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I don't really need to see a concept design. And I think if there's gonna be a, con a competitive RFP process that comes out of this at some point, mm -hmm. the... Uh, the people that might enter that may not want to show their hand. Exactly. So I, I think you are in a bit of a rock, you know, in a hard place. But um, I think some support from the bid would be would be great. You know, yes. I mean, why are we doing this? <laughs> no, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Janet? So I, I would like to have information on the other two options. And so, you know, if combining the Amity Street lot with the Bank of America lot gives you 400 parking spaces and an attractive storefronts, you know, that might be gold compared to, you know, just an extra 123 spaces. And so, you know, if you look at the 1990 report, it's a little bit out of date because I think, um, um, it's a little out of date, but it's it's not. They don't have super complicated drawings of the um, the um, Bank Center lot or the Amity Street lot, and so and actually there's a house in the Amity Street area that is no longer exists, and the Bank of America, the um, People's Bank came in. So things have changed a bit, but I don't think they're they're not super complicated drawings. And so I think if you have some bid architects, they could just put a, some some stuff together and estimate like oh how many spots. Um, they can do. If they can't do that, then we're sort of left kind of looking at this one option, wondering what else is out there. 
Oh, so, that's what I've said, that this is yeah. the one option on the table. But if the board wants this, then I would have to. But at this time, uh, what I'm offering or what I'm willing to do is bring forward, a, a, you know, a, people speaking on this site. That's it. Not looking at other sites, not doing comparative analysis, nothing like that. Um, they would be speaking on why they think this site is, is good for the town, good for business, why they are pushing it, and why they think that if, if you do rezone, there will be uh, um, interest in doing something. That's what I can offer you. That's it. And I, I would add, like, you know, also, I mean, looking at your abutters, I mean, St. Saint, Saint Bridget's, yep. uh, maybe, um, you know, willing to, you know, do something in CVS, maybe willing to do something. And it's like, it would be, I think, um, a shame, you know, not to really work with the abutters to make sure that this thing is fully, you know, evaluated uh, versus like, you know, shoehorning it into the, the town owned portion of that, because it, it is, um, you know, if we're going to have a parking garage, it seems like, yeah, that, that, that would be a great place to have it. Uh, so some work to do, I think. Um, so, um, so we voted to, to, continue, the, uh, to continue this to the 29th. And George, thank you so much. You did a great job. Um, and I guess we get back into our, you know, agenda, agenda here, you. old business, new business. <laughs> thank you. Chris, what do we have for old business? No old business. Okay, new business. New business is that I'm going to be asking you to vote on an extension of the time for the uh, preliminary subdivision plan to be reviewed. Um, the preliminary subdivision plan, which you know about, is on 11, 13, and 15 East Pleasant Street. And um, it has it was filed with the town clerk on July 12th. The date of August 26th is day 45. So um, I'm going to be bringing um, a request that you vote to extend that time to you on um, August 18th. And I may need to also advertise a public hearing for August 25th. I have to get a final confirmation about that. Um, and so far I have Doug Marshall who has volunteered himself to um, come on that night. And he and I could come on that night if we need to open a public hearing on August 25th and spend very little time. And maybe we could get um, one of our staff members here in um, continuing that public hearing to sometime in the future. So anyway, it's a complicated situation, but I wanted to let you know that I, I would like to bring a vote to you on August 18th for you to um, decide whether to um, grant an extension of that time of 45 days to review. So that's one thing that's coming up. Um, which project was that? I'm sorry. Oh, this is the preliminary subdivision plan that was filed by, um, Our, filed by the owner. Okay. It's actually not it was really filed by the owner of the archipelago project okay. site. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. No. And, and yeah, so. And you had something else? Well, there are a lot of zoning amendments coming up. I think I sent an email to Jack about what uh, the plan mm -hmm. is, but what we're considering right now is that mixed use buildings and ADUs would also be coming to you on August 18th, and we would save parking and apartments for um, September 1st. So that gives okay. you a little idea of how that's right. it's going to be separated out. Janet had asked that we try to predict, um, you know, what our upcoming meetings will be. So I, I will try to put something together about that, but I thought I'd give you a heads up tonight about it. Okay. Thank you. Um, form A in our subdivision applications? No form A's. Okay. And then uh, ZPA applications? None to report tonight. Good. Um, upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications? So we do have the Amherst College sign project, and we also have 462 Main Street, 
which is going to be coming back to you on August 18th. Um, the Amherst College Sign Project will be September 1st. Okay. Do we know what beyond September 1st, what might be on our docket? The only thing I'm sure of is, well, I'm reasonably sure that the preliminary subdivision plan, uh, if it goes to a public hearing would be on September 29th, which would be the same night as this continuing discussion about rezoning of the parking lot. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll just yeah, just keep us abreast. Um, I know we're we're looking at you know I I, I think we were going to discuss scheduling because you know felt a little overloaded. You know what's coming up uh, and that, but um, looks like we're going to take a nice pause because uh, we're going to meet for two weeks, which is like normal. A record, yeah. right? <laughs> Um, so for the planning board, uh, committees and, and liaison reports, Pioneer Valley planning committee, uh, planning commission is actually, we haven't met for like a month or two because of, you know, it's summer, uh, which is interesting. So, uh, no news to report there. Um, I did ask them about parking though, to get some input from parking, you know, from other cities in, in Western Mass, and I have not got a response from them, but um, I think that would be beneficial to us as we're looking at, you know, the parking bylaw. But um, there's also that interaction of they're in a consulting role where we would have to engage them to do certain things, but I just, <laughs> I just wanted readily available in information and so we'll see what happens. So, um, and then uh, Andrew is not here for the CPA. Uh, Doug, I, I'm, I'm waiting with bated breath on your Ag Commission report here. No news to report yet, <laughs> nothing, nothing has happened. <laughs> we're, we're, we're taking a summer holiday. Oh, nice. Uh, I should have joined that committee. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. Um, so uh, Tom, design review board. Um, nothing. We haven't met um, since we've talked about 11 Pleasant. So um, we have an upcoming meeting talking about some signage for Boltwood. Um, I'll update you guys after that meeting. It's next week. Okay. Thank you. And uh, CRC News, Chris? CRC met on the 27th of July, but um, they didn't need to have us there. They were talking about the uh, housing policy and um, their upcoming meeting though is going to be interesting. They're gonna be discussing the rezoning of the parking lot that you all spent a lot of time on tonight. They're gonna to be discussing that on August 10th. And then um, depending on how much time they have, they're also probably going to be discussing the other zoning amendments, but they're reluctant to um, act on any of their recommendations until after the planning board acts. So um, I don't think they will actually vote next Tuesday, but any of you who have time might wanna tune into their CRC meeting, which starts at two o'clock on Tuesday. Very good. Well, I'm on vacation for the first time uh, next week. Uh, that's my report. Uh, excited about that. I'll make sure that none of you can contact me. <laughs> I'll be unplugged. Um, so uh, report to staff, Chris. I'm on vacation next week too. So nothing's going to happen. Yay. <laughs> No, that's Are not we true. Getting... The planning staff is going to be busy in Rob's. Right. Oh, my time, God. So. I, I yep. can imagine. And Pam. We're going to drive Rob crazy. What a summer. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we adjourn. And thank you, Rob, for joining us. Um, and uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Thank you.